Unhappy is he to whom memories of childhood bring only fear and sadness. Wretched is he who looks back upon lone hours in vast and dismal chambers with brown hangings and maddening rows of antique books, for upon odd watches and twilight groves of grotesque, gigantic, and vine-encumbered trees that silently wave twisted branches far aloft. Such a lot the gods gave to me, to me, the dazed, the disappointed, the barren, the broken, and yet I am strangely content and cling desperately to those seer memories when my mind momentarily threatens to reach beyond to the other. I know not where I was born, save that the castle was infinitely old and infinitely horrible, full of dark passages and having high ceilings where the eye could only find cobwebs and shadows. The stones in the crumbling corridors seemed always hideously damp, and there was an accursed smell everywhere as of the piled up corpses of dead generations. It was never light, so that I used sometimes to light candles and gaze steadily at them for relief. Nor was there any sun outdoors, since the terrible trees grew high above the topmost accessible tower. There was one black tower which reached above the trees into the unknown outer sky, but that was partly ruined and could not be ascended save by a well-nigh impossible climb up the sheer wall stone by stone. I must have lived years in this place, but I cannot measure the time. Beings must have cared for my needs, yet I cannot recall any person except myself or anything alive but the noiseless rats and bats and spiders. I think that whoever nursed me must have been shockingly aged, since my first conception of a living person was that of something mockingly like myself, yet distorted, shriveled, and decaying like the castle. To me there was nothing grotesque in the bones and skeletons that strode some of the stone crypts deep down among the foundations. I fantastically associated these things with everyday events and thought them more natural than the colored pictures of living beings which I found in many of the moldy books. From such books I learned all that I know. No teacher urged or guided me, and I do not recall hearing any human voice in all those years, not even my own. For although I have read of speech, I have never thought to try to speak aloud. My aspect was a matter equally unthought of, for there were no mirrors in the castle, and I merely regarded myself by instinct as akin to the youthful figures I saw drawn and painted in the books. I felt conscious of youth, because I remembered so little. Outside, across the putrid moat and under dark mute trees, I would often lie and dream for hours about what I read in the books and would longingly picture myself amidst gay crowds in the sunny world beyond the endless forest. Once, I tried to escape from the forest, but as I went farther from the castle, the shade grew denser and the air more filled with brooding fear, so I ran frantically back lest I lose my way in a labyrinth of nighted silence. So through endless twilights I dreamed and waited, though I knew not what I waited for. Then. In the shadowy solitude, my longing for light grew so frantic that I could rest no more, and I lifted entreating hands to the single black ruined tower that reached above the forest into the unknown outer sky. And at last I resolved to scale that tower, fall though I might, since it were better to glimpse the sky and perish than to live without ever beholding day. In the dank twilight, I climbed the worn and aged stone stairs till I reached the level where they ceased and thereafter I clung perilously to small footholds leading upwards. Ghastly and terrible was that dead, stairless cylinder of rock, black, ruined, and deserted, and sinister, with startled bats whose wings made no noise. But more ghastly and terrible still was the slowness of my progress. For climb as I might, the darkness overhead grew no thinner, and a new chill as of haunted and venerable mold assailed me. I shivered as I wondered why I did not reach the light, and would have looked down had I dared. I fancied that night had come suddenly upon me, and vainly gripped with one free hand for a window embrasure, that I might peer out and above and try to judge the height I had attained. All at once, after an infinity of awesome, sightless crawling up that concave and desperate precipice, I felt my head touch a solid thing, and I knew I must have gained a roof, or at least some kind of floor. In the darkness, I raised my free hand and tested the barrier, finding it stone and immovable. Then came a steady circuit of the tower, clinging to whatever holds the slimy wall could give, till finally my testing hand found the barrier yielding, and I turned upward again, 
pushing the slab or door with my head as I used both hands in my fearful ascent. There was no light revealed above, and as my hands went higher I knew that my climb was for the nuns ended, since the slab was the trap door of an aperture leading to a level stone surface of greater circumference than the tower itself no doubt the floor of some lofty and capacious observation chamber. I crawled through carefully, and tried to prevent the heavy slab from falling back into place, but I failed in the latter attempt. As I lay exhausted on the stone floor, I heard the eerie echoes of its fall, but hoped when necessary to pry it open again. Believing I was now at a prodigious height, far above the cursed branches of the wood, I dragged myself up from the floor and fumbled about for windows, that I might look for the first time upon the sky and the moon and the stars of which I had read. But on every hand I was disappointed, since all that I found were vast shelves of marble bearing odious oblong boxes of disturbing size. More and more I reflected and wondered what hoary secrets might abide in this high apartment so many aeons cut off from the castle below. Then, unexpectedly, my hands came upon a doorway. There hung a portal of stone, rough with strange chiseling. Trying it, I found it locked. But with a supreme burst of strength, I overcame all obstacles and dragged it open inward. As I did so, there came to me the purest ecstasy I have ever known. For shining tranquilly through an ornate grating of iron and down a short stone passageway of steps that ascended from the newly found doorway was the radiant full moon which I had never before seen save in dreams and in vague visions I dared not call memories. Fancying now that I had attained the very pinnacle of the castle, I commenced to rush up the few steps beyond the door, but the sudden veiling of the moon by a cloud caused me to stumble, and I felt my way more slowly in the dark. It was still very dark when I reached the grating, which I tried carefully and found unlocked, but which I did not open for fear of falling from the amazing height to which I had climbed. Then the moon came out. Most demonical of all shocks is that of the abysmally unexpected and grotesquely unbelievable. Nothing I had before undergone could compare in terror with what I now saw, with the bizarre marvels that sight implied. The sight itself was as simple as it was stupefying, for it was merely this. Instead of a dizzying prospect of treetops seen from a lofty eminence, there stretched around me on a level through the grating nothing less than the solid ground. Decked and diversified by marble slabs and columns and overshadowed by an ancient stone church whose ruined spire gleamed spectrally in the moonlight. Half unconscious, I opened the grating and staggered out upon the white gravel path that stretched away in two directions. My mind, stunned and chaotic as it was, still held the frantic craving for light. And not even the fantastic wonder which had happened could stay my course. I neither knew nor cared whether my experience was insanity, dreaming, or magic, but was determined to gaze on brilliance and gaiety at any cost. I knew not who I was or what I was or what my surroundings might be, though as I continued to stumble along I became conscious of a kind of fearsome latent memory that made my progress not wholly fortuitous. I passed under an arch out of that region of slabs and columns and wandered through the open country sometimes following the visible road, but sometimes leaving it curiously to tread across meadows where only occasional ruins bespoke of the ancient presence of a forgotten road. Once I swam across a swift river where crumbling mossy masonry told of a bridge long vanished. Over two hours must have passed before I reached what seemed to be my goal, a venerable ivied castle in a thickly wooded park, maddeningly familiar yet full of perplexing strangeness to me. I saw that the moat was filled in, and that some of the well-known towers were demolished whilst new wings existed to confuse the beholder. But what I observed with chief interest and delight were the open windows, gorgeously ablaze with light and sending forth sounds of the gayest revelry. Advancing to one of these, I looked in and saw an oddly dressed company, indeed making merry and speaking brightly to one another. I had never seemingly heard human speech before, and could guess only vaguely what was said. Some of the faces seemed to hold expressions that brought up incredibly remote recollections. Others were utterly alien. I now stepped through the low window into the brilliantly lighted room, stepping as I did so from my single bright moment of hope to my blackest convulsion of despair and realization. 
The nightmare was quick to come, for as I entered, there occurred immediately one of the most terrifying demonstrations I had ever conceived. Scarcely had I crossed the sill, when there descended upon the whole company a sudden and unheralded fear of hideous intensity, distorting every face and evoking the most horrible screams from nearly every throat. Flight was universal, and in the clamor and panic several fell in a swoon and were dragged away by their madly fleeing companions. Many covered their eyes with their hands and plunged blindly and awkwardly in their race to escape, overturning furniture and stumbling against the walls before they managed to reach one of the many doors. The cries were shocking, and as I stood in the brilliant apartment alone and dazed, listening to her vanishing echoes, I trembled at the thought of what might be lurking near me unseen. At a casual inspection, the room seemed deserted, but when I moved toward one of the alcoves, I thought I detected a presence of life there. A hint of motion beyond the golden arch doorway leading to another and somewhat familiar room. As I approached the arch, I began to perceive the presence more clearly, and then, with the first and last sound I ever uttered, a ghastly eulogation that revolted me almost as poignantly as its noxious cause, I beheld in full frightful vividness the inconceivable, indescribable, and unmentionable monstrosity which had by its simple appearance changed the merry company to a herd of delirious fugitives. I cannot even hint what it was like, for it was a compound of all the unclean, uncanny, unwelcome, abnormal, and detestable. It was a ghoulish shade of decay, antiquity, and desolation, the putrid, dripping eidolon of unwholesome revelation, the awful bearing of that which the merciful earth should always hide. God knows it was not of this world or no longer of this world, yet to my horror I saw in its eaten away and bone revealing outlines a leering abhorrent travesty on a human shape. And in this moldy, disintegrating apparel, an unspeakable quality that chilled me even more. I was almost paralyzed, but not too much so to make a feeble effort towards flight. A backward stumble which failed to break the spell in which the nameless, voiceless monster held me. My eyes bewitched by the glassy orbs which stared loathsomely into them, refused to close, though they were mercifully blurred and shewed the terrible object, but indistinctly after the first shock. I tried to raise my hands to shun out the sight, yet so stunned were my nerves that my arm could not fully obey my will. The attempt, however, was enough to disturb my balance, so that I had to stagger forward several steps to avoid falling. As I did so, I became suddenly and agonizingly aware of the nearness of the carrion thing whose hideous hollow breathing I half fancied I could hear. Nearly mad, I found myself yet able to throw out a hand to ward off the fetid apparition which pressed so close. When in one cataclysmic second of cosmic nightmarishness and hellish accident my fingers touched the rotting outstretched paw of the monster beneath the golden arch. I did not shriek. But all of the fiendish ghouls that ride the night shrieked for me, as in the same second there crashed down upon my mind a single and fleeting avalanche of soul-annihilating memory. I knew in that second all that had been. I remembered beyond the frightful castle and the trees and recognized the altered edifice in which I now stood. I recognized, most terrible of all, the unholy abomination that stood leering before me as I withdrew my sullied fingers from its own. But in the cosmos there is balm as well as bitterness, and that balm is Nepenthe. In the supreme horror of that second I forgot what had horrified me, and a burst of black memory vanished in a chaos of echoing images. In a dream I fled from that haunted and accursed pile and ran swiftly and silently in the moonlight. When I returned to the churchyard place of marble and went down the steps, I found the stone trap door immovable, but I was not sorry, for I hated the antique castle and the trees. Now I ride with the mocking and friendly ghouls of the night wind and play by day among the catacombs of Nefren Ka in the sealed and unknown valley of the Hadoff by the Nile. I know that light is not for me, save that of the moon or of the rock tombs of Neb nor in the gaiety save the unnamed feast of Natokris beneath the Great Pyramid. Yet in my new wildness and freedom, I almost welcomed the bitterness of alienage. For although Nepenthe has calmed me, I know always that I am an outsider, a stranger in the century and among those who are still men. 
This I have known ever since I stretched out my fingers to the abomination within that great gilded frame. Stretched out my fingers and touched a cold and unyielding surface of polished glass. It is said that in Ulfar, which lies beyond the river's sky, no man may kill a cat. And this I can verily believe as I gaze upon him who sitteth purring before the fire. For the cat is cryptic and close to the strange things which men cannot see. He is the soul of antique Egyptus and bearer of tales from forgotten cities in Monroe and Ophir. He is the kin of the jungle's lords and heir to the secrets of hoary and sinister Africa. The Sphinx is his cousin and he speaks her language, but he is more ancient than the Sphinx, and remembers that which she hath forgotten. In Ulfar, before even the Burgesses forbade the killing of cats, there dwelt an old cotter and his wife who delighted to trap and slay the cats of their neighbors. Why they did this, I know not, save that many hate the voice of the cats in the night, and take it ill that cats should run stealthily above yards and gardens at twilight. But whatever the reason, this old man and woman took pleasure in trapping and slaying every cat which came near to their howl, and for some of the sounds heard after dark many villagers fancied that the manner of slaying was exceedingly peculiar. But the villagers did not discuss such things with the old man and his wife, because of the habitual expression on the withered faces of the two, and because their cottage was so small and so darkly hidden under the spreading oaks at the back of the neglected yard. In truth, much as the owners of cats hated these odd folk, they feared them more, and instead of berating them as brutal assassins, merely took care that no cherished pet or mauser should stray toward the remote howl under the dark trees. When through some unavoidable oversight a cat was missed, and sounds heard after dark, the loser would faintly lament impotently, or console himself by thanking fate that it is not one of his children who had thus vanished. For the people of Ulfar were simple and knew not whence it is all cats first came. One day a caravan of strange wanderers from the south entered the narrow cobble streets of Ulfar. Dark wanderers they were, and like the other roving folk who passed through the village twice every year. In the marketplace they told fortunes for silver and bought gay beads from the merchants. What was the land of these wanderers none could tell, but it was seen that they were given to strange prayers, and they had painted on the sides of their wagons strange figures with human bodies and the heads of cats, hawks, rams, and lions. And the leader of the caravan wore a headdress with two horns and a curious disc betwixt the horns. There wasn't a singular caravan little boy with no father or mother, but only a tiny black kitten to cherish. The plague had not been kind to him, yet had left him with this small furry thing to mitigate his sorrow. And when one is very young, one can find great relief in the lively antics of a black kitten. So the boy whom the dark people called Menace smiled more often than he wept as he sat playing with his graceful kitten on the steps of an oddly painted wagon. On the third morning of the wanderer's stay in Ulfar, Menace could not find his kitten. And as he sobbed aloud in the marketplace, certain villagers told him of the old man and his wife, and of sounds heard in the night. When he heard these things, his sobbing gave place to meditation and finally to prayer. He stretched out his arms towards the sun and prayed in a tongue no villager could understand, though indeed the villagers did not try very hard to understand, since their attention was mostly taken up by the sky and the odd shapes the clouds were assuming. It was very peculiar, but as the little boy uttered his petition, there seemed to form overhead the shadowy nebulous figures of exotic things of hybrid creatures crowned with horn-flaked discs. Nature is full of such illusions to impress the imaginative. That night the wanderers left Alfar and were never seen again, and the householders were troubled when they noticed that in all the village there was not a cat to be found. From each hearth the familiar cat had vanished, cats large and small, black, gray, striped yellow and white. Old Karen, the burgemaster, swore that the dark folk had taken the cats away in revenge for the killing of Menace's kitten, and cursed the caravan and the little boy. But Nith, the lean notary, declared that the old cotter and his wife were more likely persons to suspect, for their hatred of cats was notorious and increasingly bold. Still, no one durst complain to the sinister couple. Even when little Atal, the innkeeper's son, vowed that he had at twilight seen all the cats of Ulfar in that accursed yard under the trees, pacing very slowly and solemnly in a circle around the cottage, two abreast, as if in performance of some unheard rite of beasts. 
The villagers did not know how much to believe from so small a boy. And though they feared that the evil pair had charmed the cast to their death, they preferred not to chide the old cotter till they met him outside his dark and repellent yard. So, Ulfar went to sleep in vain anger. And when the people awakened at dawn, behold, every cat was back at its accustomed hearth. Large and small, black, gray, striped, yellow and white, none was missing. Very sleek and fat did the cats appear, and sonorous with purring content. The citizens talked with one another of the affair and marveled not a little. Old Karen again insisted that it was the dark folk who had taken them, since Cat did not return alive from the cottage of the ancient man and his wife. But all agreed on one thing, that the refusal of all the cats to eat their portions of meat or drink their sausage of milk was exceedingly curious. And for two whole days, the sleek, lazy cats of Ulfar would touch no food, but only doze by the fire or in the sun. It is full a week before the villagers noticed that no lights were appearing at dusk in the windows of the cottage under the trees. Then the lean Nif remarked that no one had seen the old man or his wife since the night the cats were away. In another week, the burgemaster decided to overcome his fears and call at the strange silent dwelling as a matter of duty. Though in so doing, he was careful to take with him Shang the blacksmith and fall the cutter of stone as witnesses. And when they had broken down the frail door, they found only this two cleanly picked human skeletons on the earthen floor, and a number of singular beetles crawling in the shadowy corners. There was subsequently much talk among the burgesses of Ulfar. Zaf, the coroner, disputed length with Nif, the lean notary, and Cranon and Shang and Fall were overwhelmed with questions. Even little Atal, the innkeeper's son, was closely questioned and given a sweet meat as reward. They talked of the old cotter and his wife, of the caravan of dark wanderers, of small menace and his black kitten, of the prayer of menace and of the sky during that prayer, of the doings of the cats on the night the caravan left, and of what was later found in the cottage under the dark trees in the repellent yard. And in the end, the Burgesses passed that remarkable law which is told of by the traders in Hatzeg and discussed by the travelers in Nir, namely, the Nolfar. No man may kill a cat. It was the design of Angela Ritchie and Joe Chanick and Manuel Silva to call on the terrible old man. This old man dwells all alone in a very ancient house on the water street near the sea and is reputed to be both exceedingly rich and exceedingly feeble which forms a situation very attractive to men of the profession of Meriz, Ricci, Zanuck and Silva, for that profession was nothing less than dignified robbery. The inhabitants of Kingsport say that they think many things about the terrible old man, which generally keep him safe from the attention of gentlemen like Mr. Ricci and his colleagues. Despite the almost certain fact that he hides a fortune of indefinite magnitude somewhere about his musty and venerable abode, he is, in truth, a very strange person believed to have been a captain of East Indian clipper ships in his day, so old that no one can remember when he was young and so taciturn that few know his real name. Among the gnarled trees in the front yard of his aged and neglected place, he maintains a strange collection of large stones, oddly grouped and painted so that they resemble the idols in some obscure eastern temple. This collection frightens away most of the small boys who love to taunt the terrible old man about his long white hair and beard or to break the small paned windows of his dwelling with wicked missiles. But there are other things which frighten the older and more curious folk who sometimes steal up to the house to peer in through the dusty panes. These folk say that on a table in a bare room on the ground floor are many peculiar bottles, and each a small piece of lead suspended pendulum-wise from a string. And they say that the terrible old man talks to these bottles, addressing them by such names as Jack, Scarface, Long Tom, Spanish Joe, Peters, and Mate Ellis, and that whenever he speaks to a bottle, the little lead pendulum within makes certain definite vibrations, as if to answer. Those who have watched the tall, lean, terrible old man in these peculiar conversations do not watch him again. But Angelo Ricci and Joe Tazek and Manuel Silva were not of Kingsport blood. They were of the new and heterogeneous alien stock which lies outside the charmed circle of New England life and traditions, and they saw in the terrible old man merely a tottering, almost helpless greybeard who could not walk without the aid of his knotted cane and whose thin, weak hands shook pitifully. 
they were really quite sorry in their way for the lonely, unpopular old fellow whom everybody shunned and at whom all the dogs barked singularly. But business is business, and to a robber whose soul is in his profession, there is a lure and a challenge about a very old and very feeble man who has no account at the bank and who pays for his necessities at the village store with Spanish gold and silver minted two centuries ago. Ricci, Zanuck, and Silva selected the night of April 11 for their call. Mr. Ricci and Mr. Silva were to interview the poor old gentleman whilst Mr. Sanek waited for them and their presumable metallic burden with a covered motor car in Ship Street by the gate in the tall rear wall of the host's grounds. The desire to avoid needless explanations in case of unexpected police intrusions prompted these plans for a quiet and unostatious departure. As prearranged, the three adventurers started out separately in order to prevent any evil-minded suspicions afterwards. Ricci and Silva met in Water Street by the old man's front gate. Although they did not like the way the moon shone down upon the painted stones through the budding branches of gnarled trees, they had more important things to think about than mere idle superstition. They feared it might be unpleasant work, making the terrible old man loquacious concerning his hoarded gold and silver, for HC captains are notably stubborn and perverse. Still, he was very old and very feeble, and there were two visitors. Ricci and Silva were experienced in the art of making unwilling persons voluble, and the screams of a weak and exceptionally venerable man can easily be muffled. So they moved up to the one lighted window and heard a terrible old man talking childishly to his bottles with pendulums. Then they donned masks and knocked politely at the weather stained oaken door. Waiting seemed very long to Mr. Sonic as he fidgeted restlessly in the covered motor car by the terrible old man's back gate in Ship Street. He was more than ordinarily tender-hearted, and he did not like the hideous screams he had heard in the ancient house just after the hour appointed for the deed. Had he not told his colleagues to be as gentle as possible with the pathetic old sea captain? Very nervously, he watched that narrow oaken gate in the high and ivy-clad stone wall. Frequently, he consulted his watch and wondered at the delay. Had the old man died before revealing where his treasure was hidden, and had a thorough search become necessary? Mr. Sonic did not like to wait so long in the dark in such a place. Then, he sensed a soft tread or tapping on the walk inside the gate, heard a gentle fumbling at the rusty latch, and saw the narrow, heavy door swing inward. And in the pallid glow, of the single dim street lamp, he strained his eyes to see what his colleagues had brought out that sinister house which loomed so close behind. When he looked, he did not see what he had expected, for his colleagues were not there at all, but only the terrible old man leaning quietly on his knotted cane and smiling hideously. Mr. Sonic had never before noticed the color of that man's eyes. Now he saw that they were yellow. Little things make considerable excitement in little towns, which is the reason that Kingsport people talked all that spring and summer about the three unidentified bodies, horribly slashed as with many cutlasses and horribly mangled as by the tread of many cruel boot heels which the tide washed in. And some people even spoke of things as trivial as the deserted motor car found in Ship Street, or certain especially in human cries, probably of a stray animal or a migratory bird heard in the night by wakeful citizens. But in this idle village gossip, the terrible old man took no interest at all. He was by nature reserved, and when one is aged and feeble, one's reserve is doubly strong. Besides, so ancient a sea captain must have witnessed scores of things much more stirring in the far-off days of his unremembered youth. I am writing this under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable, I can bear the torture no longer and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or degenerate. When you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize, 
why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation, so that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we, of her crew, were treated with all the fairness and consideration due to us as naval prisoners. So liberal indeed was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a complete navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Of the longitude I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. The weather kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know, for my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. When at last I awakened, it was to discover myself half-sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see, and in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. For there was in the air and in the rotting soil a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unyielding plain. Perhaps I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. There was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions which for innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, strain my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. For several hours I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. That night I slept but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with greater things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. That night I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first despised it. By the fourth evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance, an intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams are so wild that night, but ere the waning and fantastic gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain, I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again, and in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. 
I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me, but I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down at the other side into the measurable pits or canyon whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illuminate. I felt myself on the edge of the world, peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent, whilst after a drop of a few hundred feet, the acclivity became very gradual. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian depths where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me, an object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. There was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself, but I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express, for despite its enormous magnitude and its position in the abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the worksmanship and, perhaps, the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's light, I examined my surroundings more closely. The moon, now near its zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in its chasm and revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping at my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphs unknown to me, and unlike anything I had ever seen in books, consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, occupy, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bas reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men, though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto or paying homage to some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Of their faces and forms I dare not speak in detail for the mere remembrances make me grow faint. Grotesque beyond imagination of a Poe or a Bulver, they were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background, for one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale represented as but little larger than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size, but in a moment decided they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe, some tribe whose last descendants had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. Then. Suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Vast, polyphemous-like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boats, I remember little. I believe I sang a great deal, and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. 
I have indistinct recollections of a great storm some time after I reached the boat. At any rate, I know that I heard peals of thunder and other tones which nature utters only in her wildest of moods. When I came out of the shadows, I was in a San Francisco hospital, brought thither by the captain of an American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing, nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon such a thing which I knew they could not believe. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god, but soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. I have tried morphine, but the drug is given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all. Having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow man, often I ask myself if it could not all have been pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man-of-war. This I ask myself, whatever does there come before me of hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed, worshipping their ancestors' stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day where they may rise above the billows to drag down in their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean floor shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. It shall not find me. God, that hand. The window. The window. I have examined maps of the city with the greatest care, yet have never again found the Rue d'Orsay. These maps have not been modern maps alone, for I know that names change. I have, on the contrary, delved deeply into all the antiquities of the place, and have personally explored every region of whatever name which could possibly answer to the street known as the Rue d'Orsay. But despite all I have done, it remains a humiliating fact that I cannot find the house, the street, or even the locality where, during the last months of my impoverished life as a student of metaphysics at the university, I heard the music of Eric Zahn. That my memory is broken, I do not wonder, for my health, physical and mental, was gravely disturbed throughout the period of my residence in the Rue d'Orsay, and I recall that I took none of my few acquaintances there. But that I cannot find the place again is both singular and perplexing. For it was within a half hour's walk of the university and was distinguished by peculiarities which could hardly be forgotten by anyone who had been there. I have never met a person who has seen the Rue d'Orsay. The Rue d'Orsay lay across a dark river bordered by precipitous brick blear windowed warehouses and spanned by a ponderous bridge of dark stone. It was always shadowy along that river as if the smoke of neighboring factories shut out the sun perpetually. The river was also odorous with evil stenches which I have never smelled elsewhere and which may someday help me find it, since I should recognize them at once. Beyond the bridge were narrow cobbled streets with rails, and then came the ascent, at first gradual but incredibly steep as the Rue d'Orsay was reached. I have never seen another street as narrow and as steep as the Rue d'Orsay, it was almost a cliff, close to all vehicles, consisting in several places of flights of steps and ending at the top in a lofty ivied wall. Its paving was irregular, sometimes stone slabs, sometimes cobblestones, and sometimes bare earth with struggling greenish-gray vegetation. The houses were tall, peak-roofed, incredibly old, and crazily leaning backward, forward, and sidewise. Occasionally an opposite pair, both leaning forward, almost met across the street like an arch, and certainly they kept most of the light from the ground below. There were a few overhead bridges from house to house across the streets, 
The inhabitants of that street impressed me peculiarly. At first, I thought it was because they were all silent and reticent, but later decided it was because they were all very old. I do not know how I came to live on such a street, but I was not myself when I moved there. I had been living in many poor places, always evicted for want of money, until at last I came upon that tottering house in the Rue d'Orsay kept by a paralytic Blando. It was the third house from the top of the street, and by far the tallest of them all. My room was on the fifth story, the only inhabited room there since the house was almost empty. On the nights I arrived, I heard strange music from the peaked garrets overhead, and the next day asked the old Blandot about it. He told me it was an old German viol player, a strange dumb man who signed his name as Eric Zahn and who played evenings in a cheap theater orchestra, adding that Zahn's desire to play in the night after his return from the theater was the reason he had chosen this lofty and isolated garret room whose single gable window was the only point on the street from which one could look over the terminating wall at the declivity and panorama beyond. Thereafter I heard Zahn every night, and although he kept me awake, I was haunted by the weirdness of his music. Knowing little of the art myself, I was yet certain that none of his harmonies had any relation to music I had heard before, and concluded that he was a composer of highly original genius. The longer I listened, the more I was fascinated, until after a week, I resolved to make the old man's acquaintance. One night, as he was returning from his work, I intercepted Zahn in the hallway and told him that I would like to know him and be with him when he played. He was a small, lean, bent person with shabby clothes, blue eyes, grotesque, satyr-like face, and nearly bald head. And at my first words seemed both angered and frightened. My obvious friendliness, however, finally melted him and he grudgingly motioned to me to follow him up the dark, creaking, and rickety attic stairs. His room, one of only two in the steeply pitched garret, was on the west side, toward the high wall that formed the upper end of the street. Its size was very great, and seemed the greater because of the extraordinary bareness and neglect. Of furniture, there was only a narrow iron bedstead, a dingy washboard, a small table, a large bookcase, an iron music rack, and three old-fashioned chairs. Sheets of music were piled in disorder about the floor. The walls were of bare boards and had probably never known plaster, whilst the abundance of dust and cobwebs made the place seem more deserted than inhabited. Evidently, Eric Zahn's world of beauty lay in some far cosmos of the imagination. Motioning me to sit down, the dumb man closed the door, turned a large wooden bolt, and lighted a candle to augment the one he had brought with him. He now removed his vial from its moth-eaten covering, and taking it, seated himself in the least uncomfortable of the chairs. He did not employ the music rack, but offering no choice and playing from memory, enchanted me for over an hour with strains that I had never heard before, strains which must have been of his own devising. To describe their exact nature is impossible for one unversed in music. They were a kind of fugue, with recurrent passages of the most captivating quality but to me were notable for the absence of any of the weird notes I had overheard from my room below on other occasions. Those haunting notes I had remembered and had often hummed and whistled inaccurately to myself. So when the player at length laid down his bow, I asked him if he would render some of them. As I began my request, the wrinkled, satyr-like face lost the bored placidity it had possessed during the playing and seemed to shew the same curious mixture of anger and fright which I had noticed when I first accosted the old man. For a moment, I was inclined to use persuasion, regarding rather lightly the whims of senility, and even tried to awaken my host's weirder mood by whistling a few of the strains to which I had listened the night before. But I did not pursue this course for more than a moment, for when the dumb musician recognized the whistled air, his face grew suddenly distorted with an expression wholly beyond analysis, and his long, cold, bony right hand reached out to stop my mouth and silence the crude imitation. As he did this, he further demonstrated his eccentricity by casting a startled glance towards the lone curtained window, as if fearful of some intruder. A glance doubly absurd, since the garret stood high and inaccessible above all adjacent roofs, the window being the only point on the steep street, as the concierge had told me, from which one could see over the wall at the summit. The old man's glance brought Blandot's remarks to my mind, and with a certain capriciousness, I felt a wish to look out over the wide and dizzying panorama of moonlit roofs and city lights beyond the hilltop, which of all the dwellers in the Rue d'Assay, only this crabbed musician could see. 
I moved towards the window and would have drawn aside the nondescript curtains when with a frightened rage even greater than before the dumb lodger was upon me again. This time motioning with his head towards the door as he nervously strove to drag me thither with both hands. Now, thoroughly disgusted with my host, I ordered him to release me and told him I would go at once. His clutch relaxed, and as he saw my disgust and offense, his own anger seemed to subside. He tightened his relaxing grip, but this time in a friendly manner, forcing me into a chair. Then with an appearance of wistfulness crossing the littered table where he wrote many words with a pencil in the labored French of a foreigner. The note which he finally handed me was an appeal for tolerance and forgiveness. Zan said that he was old, lonely, and afflicted with strange fears and nervous disorders connected with his music and with other things. He had enjoyed my listening to his music and wished I would come again and not mind his eccentricities. But he could not play to another his weird harmonies and could not bear hearing them from another, nor could he bear having anything in his room touched by another. He had not known until our hallway conversation that I could overhear his playing in my room and now asked me if I would arrange with Blando to take the lower room where I could not hear him in the night. He would, he wrote, defray the differences in rent. As I sat deciphering the execrable French, I felt more lenient toward the old man. He was a victim of physical and nervous suffering, as was I, and my metaphysical studies had taught me kindness. In the silence, there came a slight sound from the window. The shutter must have rattled in a night wind, and for some reason, I started almost as violently as did Eric Zahn, so when I had finished reading, I shook my host by the hand and departed as a friend. The next day, Blandot gave me a more expensive room on the third floor, between the apartments of an aged moneylender and the room of a respectable upholsterer. There was no one on the fourth floor. It was not long before I found that Zahn's eagerness for my company was not as great as it had been while he was persuading me to move down to the fifth story. He did not ask me to call on him, and when I did call, he appeared uneasy and played listlessly. This was always at night. In a day he slept and would admit no one. My liking for him did not grow, though the attic room and the weird music seemed to hold an odd fascination for me. I had a curious desire to look out of that window, over the wall and down the unseen slope at the glittering roofs and spires which must lie outspread there. Once I went up to the garret during theater hours, when Zahn was away, but the door was locked. What I did succeed in doing was to overhear the nocturnal playing of the dumb old man. At first I would tiptoe up to my old fifth floor, then I grew bold enough to climb the last creaking staircase to the peaked garret. There, in the narrow hall, outside a bolted door with a covered keyhole, I often heard sounds which filled me with an indefinable dread, the dread of vague wonder and brooding mystery. It was not that these sounds were hideous, for they were not, but that they held vibrations suggesting nothing of this globe of earth, and at certain intervals they assumed a symphonic quality which I could hardly conceive as produced by one player. Certainly, Eric Zahn was a genius of wild power. As the weeks passed, the playing grew wilder, whilst the old musicians acquired an increasing haggardness and furitiveness pitiful to behold. He now refused to admit me at any time, and shunned me whenever we met on the stairs. Then, one night, as I listened at the door, I heard a shrieking vial swell into a chaotic babble of sound, a pandemonium which would have led me to doubt my own sanity had there not come from behind that barred portal a piteous proof that the horror was real. The awful inarticulate cry which only a mute could utter, and which rises only in moments of the most terrible fear or anguish. I knocked repeatedly at the door, but received no response. Afterward, I waited in the black hallway, shivering with cold and fear, till I heard the poor musician's feeble effort to rise from the floor by aid of a chair. Believing him just conscious after a fainting fit, I renewed my rapping, at the same time calling out my name reassuringly. I heard Zahn stumble to the window and close both shutter and sash, then stumble to the door, which he falteringly unfastened to admit me. This time, his delight at having me present was real for his distorted face gleamed with relief while he clutched at my coat as a child clutches at its mother's skirts. Shaking pathetically, the old man forced me into a chair whilst he sank into another, beside which his viol and bow lay carelessly on the floor. He sat for some time inactive, nodding oddly, but having a paradoxically suggestion of intense and frightening listening. Subsequently, 
He seemed to be satisfied, and crossing to the chair by the table, wrote a brief note, handed it to me, and returned to the table where he began to write rapidly and incessantly. The note implored me, in the name of mercy, and for the sake of my own curiosity, to wait where I was while he prepared a full account in German of all the marvels and terrors which beset him. I waited, and the dumb man's pencil flew. It was perhaps an hour later. While I still waited, and while the old musician's feverishly written sheets still continued to pile up, that I saw Zan start as from the hint of a horrible shock. Unmistakably, he was looking at the curtained window and listening shudderingly. Then I half fancied I heard a sound myself. There was not a horrible sound, but rather an exquisitely low and infinitely distant musical note, suggesting a player in one of the neighboring houses, or in some abode beyond a lofty wall from which I had never been able to look. Upon Zahn, the effect was terrible. For dropping his pencil, suddenly he rose, seized his vial, and commenced to rend the night with the wildest playing I had ever heard from his bow save when listening at the barred door. It would be useless to describe the playing of Eric Zahn on that dreadful night was more horrible than anything I'd ever overheard, because I could now see the expression of his face, and could realize that this time the motive was stark fear. He was trying to make a noise, to ward something off, or to drown something out, what I could not imagine, awesome though I felt it must be. The playing grew fantastic, delirious, and hysterical, yet kept to its last the qualities of supreme genius which I knew this strange old man possessed. I recognized the air was a wild Hungarian dance popular in the theaters, and I reflected for a moment that this was the first time I'd ever heard Zahn play the work of another composer. Louder and louder, wilder and wilder mounted the shrieking and whining of that desperate vial. The player was dripping with an uncanny perspiration and twisted like a monkey, always looking frantically at the curtain window. His frenzied strains I could almost see shadowy satyrs and bacchanals dancing and whirling insanely through the seething abysses of clouds and smoke and lightning. And then I thought I heard a shriller, steadier note that was not from the vial. A calm, deliberate, purposeful, mocking note from far away in the west. At this juncture, the shutter began to rattle in a howling night wind which had sprung up outside as if an answer to the mad playing within. Zahn's screaming vial now outdid itself, emitting sounds I had never thought a vial could emit. The shutter ratted more loudly, unfastened, and commenced slamming against the window. Then the glass broke shiveringly under the persistent impacts, and the chill wind rushed in, making the candle sputter and rustling the sheets of paper on the table where Zahn had begun to write out his horrible secret. I looked at Zahn and saw that he was past conscious observation. His blue eyes were bulging, glassy, and sightless, and the frantic playing had become a blind, mechanical, unrecognizable orgy that no pen could ever suggest. A sudden gust, stronger than the others, caught up the manuscript and bore it toward the window. I followed the flying sheets in desperation, but they were gone before I reached the demolished panes. Then I remembered my old wish to gaze from this window, the only window in the Huda Sey from which one might see the slope beyond the wall and the city outspread beneath. It was very dark, but the city's lights always burned, and I expected to see them there amidst the rain and wind. Yet when I looked from that highest of all gable windows, looked while the candle sputtered and the insane vial howled with the night wind, I saw no city spread below and no friendly lights gleaming from remembered streets, but only the blackness of space illimitable, unimaginable space alive with motion and music and having no semblance to anything on earth. And as I stood there, looking in terror, the wind blew out both the candles and the ancient peaked garret, leaving me in a savage and incomprehensible darkness with chaos and pandemonium before me, and the demon madness of that night baying vial behind me. I staggered back in the dark, without the means of striking a light, crashing against the table, overturning a chair, and finally groping my way to the place where the blackness screamed with shocking music. To save myself and Eric Zahn, I could at least try, whatever the powers opposed to me. Once, I thought some chill thing brushed me and I screamed, but my scream could not be heard above the hideous bile. Suddenly out of the blackness, the madly sawing bow struck me, and I knew that I was close to the player. I fell ahead, touched the back of Zahn's chair, and then found and shook his shoulder in an effort to bring him to his senses. He did not respond, and still the vial shrieked on without slackening. 
I moved my hand to his head, whose mechanical nodding I was able to stop, and shouted in his ear that we must both flee from the unknown thing of the night. But he neither answered me nor abated the frenzy of his unutterable music, while all through the garret strange currents of wind seemed to dance in darkness and babble. When my hand touched his ear I shuddered, though I knew not why, knew not why I felt of this still face, the ice-cold, stiff and unbreaking face whose glassy eyes bulged uselessly into the void. And then, by some miracle finding the door and large wooden bolt, I plunged wildly away from that glassy-eyed thing in the dark and from the ghoulish howling of that accursed vial whose fury increased even as I plunged. Leaping, floating, flying down those endless stairs through the dark house, racing mindlessly out into the narrow, steep and ancient street of steps and tottering houses, clattering down the steps and over cobbles to the lower streets and the putrid canyon-walled river, panting across the great dark bridge to the broader, healthier streets and boulevards we all know. All these are terrible impressions that linger with me, and I recall that there was no wind and that the moon was out and that all the lights of the city twinkled. Despite my most careful searches and investigations, I have never since been able to find a Hudase, but I am not wholly sorry, either for this or for the lost and undreamable abysses of the closely written sheets which alone could have explained the music of Eric Zahn. You needn't think I'm crazy, Elliot. Plenty of others have queerer prejudices than this. Why don't you laugh at Oliver's grandfather who won't ride in a motor? If I don't like to die in the subway, it's my own business, and we got here more quickly anyhow in a taxi. We'd have had to walk up the hill from Park Street if we'd taken the car. I know I'm more nervous than I was when you saw me last year, but you don't need to hold a clinic over it. There's plenty of reason, God knows, and I fancy I'm likely to be sane at all. Why the third degree? You didn't used to be so inquisitive. Well, if you must hear it, I don't know why you shouldn't. Maybe you ought to, anyhow, for you kept writing me like a grieved parent when you heard I'd begun to cut the art club and keep away from Pikmin. Now that he's disappeared, I go around the club once in a while, but my nerves aren't what they were. No, I don't know what's become of Pikmin, and I don't like to guess. You might have surmised I had some inside information when I dropped him, and that's why I don't want to think where he's gone. Let the police find what they can. It won't be much, judging from the fact that they don't know yet of the old North End place he hired under the name of Peters. I'm not sure that I could find myself again, not that I'd ever try, even in broad daylight. Yes, I do know, or I'm afraid I know, why he maintained it. I'm coming to that, and... I think you'll understand before I'm through why I don't tell the police. They would ask me to guide them, but I couldn't go back there even if I knew the way. There was something there. And now I can't even use the subway or, and you may as well have your laugh at this too, go down into cellars anymore. I should think you'd have known I didn't draw Pikmin for the same silly reasons that fussy old woman like Dr. Reed or Joe Mignot or Bosworth did. Morbid art doesn't shock me, and when a man has the genius Pikmin had, I felt it an honor to know him, no matter what direction his work takes. Boss never had a greater painter than Richard Upton Pikmin. I said it at first, and I say it still. I never swerved an inch, either, when he showed me the ghoul feeding. That, you remember, was when Minot cut him. You know, it takes profound arts and profound insight into nature to turn out stuff like Pikmin's. Any magazine cover hack can splash paint around wildly and call it a nightmare or a witcher's sabbath or a portrait of the devil. But only a great painter can make such a thing really scare or ring true. That's because only a real artist knows the actual anatomy of the terrible or the physiology of fear. The exact sort of lines and proportions that connect up with latent instincts or hereditary memories of fright and the proper color contrast and lighting effects to stir the dormant stents of strangeness. I don't have to tell you why Fuseli really brings a shiver while a cheap ghost story front piece merely makes us laugh. There's something those fellows catch. Beyond life, 
They're able to make us catch for a second. Doray has it, Syme has it, Angora of Chicago has it, and Pikmin had it as no man ever had it before. Or, I hope to heaven, ever will again. Don't ask me what it is they see. You know, in ordinary art, there's all the difference in the world between the vital, breathing things drawn from nature, or models of the artificial truck that commercial small fry reel off in a bare studio by rule. Well, I should say that the really weird artist has a kind of vision which makes models or summons up what amounts to actual scenes from the spectral world that he lives in. Anyhow, he manages to turn out results that differ from the pretender's mince pie dreams in just about the same way that the life painter's results differ from the concoctions of a correspondent school cartoonist. If I ever seen what Pikmin saw, but no, here, let's have a drink before we get any deeper. God, I wouldn't be alive if I'd ever seen what that man, if he was a man, saw. You recall that Pikmin's forte was faces. I don't believe anybody since Goya could put so much of a sheer hell into a set of features or a twist of expression. And before Goya, you have to go back to the medieval chaps who did the gargoyles and chimeras on Notre Dame and Mont Saint Michel. They believed all sorts of things. Maybe they saw all sorts of things too. For the Middle Ages had some curious phases. I remember you asking Pikmin yourself once, the year before you went away, wherever in thunder he got such ideas and visions. Wasn't that a nasty laugh he gave you? It was partly because of that laugh that Reed dropped him. Reed, you know, had just taken up comparative pathology and was full of pompous inside stuff about the biological or evolutionary significance of this or that mental or physical symptom. He said Pikmin repelled him more and more every day. It almost frightened him towards the last. That the fellow's features and expression were slowly developing in a way he didn't like. In a way that wasn't human. He had a lot of talk about diet and said Pikmin must be abnormal and eccentric to the last degree. I suppose you told Reed, if you and he had any correspondence over it, that he'd let Pikmin's paintings get on his nerves or harrow up his imagination. I know I told him that myself. Then... Keep in mind that I didn't draw Pikmin for anything like this. On the contrary, my admiration for him kept on growing. For that, ghoul feeding was a tremendous achievement. As you know, the club wouldn't exhibit it, and the Museum of Fine Arts wouldn't accept it as a gift, and I can add that nobody would buy it, so Pikmin had it right in his house till he went. Now his father has it in Salem. You know Pikmin comes of old Salem stock and had a witch ancestor hanged in 1692. I got into the habit of calling on Pikmin quite often, especially after I began making notes for a monograph on weird art. Probably it was his work which put the idea into my head, and anyhow, I found him a mine of data and suggestion when I came to develop it. He shooed me all the paintings and drawings he had about, including some pen and ink sketches that would, I verily believe, have got him kicked out of the club if many of the members had seen them. Before long, I was pretty nearly a devotee, and would listen for hours like a schoolboy to art theories and philosophic speculations wild enough to qualify him for the Denver's asylum. My hero worship, coupled with the fact that people generally were commencing to have less and less to do with him, made him very confidential with me, and one evening he hinted that if I were fairly close-mouthed and none too squeamish, he might shoo me something rather unusual. Something a bit stronger than anything he had in the house. You know, he said, there are things that don't do for Newbury Streets. Things that are out of place here and that can't be conceived here anyhow. It's my business to catch the overtones of the soul and you won't find those in a proud new set of artificial streets on made land. Back Bay isn't Boston. It isn't anything yet, because it's had no time to pick up the memories and attract local spirits. If there are any ghosts here, they're the tame ghosts of Salt Marsh and Shallow Cove, and I want human ghosts. The ghosts of being highly organized enough to have looked on hell and know the meaning of what they saw. The place for an artist to live is the North End. If any athlete were sincere, he'd put up with the slums for the sake of the mass traditions. God, man, don't you realize that places like that weren't merely made but actually grew? 
Generation after generation lived and felt and died there, and in days when people weren't afraid to live and feel and die. Don't you know that there was a mill on Copps Hill in 1632? And that half the present streets were laid out by 1650? I can show you houses that stood two centuries and a half and more. Houses that have witnessed what would make a modern house crumble into powder. What do moderns know of life and the forces behind it? You call the Salem witchcraft a delusion, but I'll wage my four times great grandmother could have told you things. They hanged her on Gallows Hill, with cotton matter looking sanctimoniously on. Matter, damn him, was afraid that somebody might succeed in kicking free of this accursed cage of monotony. I wish someone had laid a spell on him or sucked his blood in the night. I can show you a house he lived in, and I can show you another he was afraid to enter in spite of all his fine bold talk. He knew things he didn't dare put into the stupid magnalia or the puerile wonders of the invisible world. Look here, do you know the whole North End once had a set of tunnels that kept certain people in touch with each other's houses and the burying ground and the sea? Let them prosecute and persecute above ground. Things went on every day and they couldn't reach. And voices laughed at night that they couldn't place. Why man out of the 10 surviving houses built before 1700 and not moved since, I'll wager that in 8. I can show you something queer in the cellar. There's hardly a month that you don't read of workmen finding bricked up arches and wells leading nowhere in this and that old place as it comes down. You could see one near Henchman Street from the elevated last year. There were witches and what their spell summoned, pirates and what they brought in from the sea, smugglers, privateers, and I tell you. People knew how to live and how to enlarge the bounds of life in the old times. This wasn't the only world a bold and wise man could know. Puh. And to think of today in contrast, with the pale pink brains that even a club of supposed artists gets shudders and convulsions if a picture goes beyond the feeling of a Beacon Street tea table. The only saving grace of the present is that it's too damn stupid to question the past very closely. What do maps and records and guidebooks really tell of the North End? Bah! At a guess, I'll guarantee to lead you to 30 or 40 alleys and networks of alleys north of Prince Street that aren't suspected by 10 living beings outside of the foreigners that swarmed them. What do these dagos know of their meeting? No, Thurber. These ancient places are dreaming gorgeously and overflowing with wonder and terror and escapes from the commonplace. And yet there's not a living soul to understand or profit by them. Or rather, there's only one living soul. For I haven't been digging around in the past for nothing. See here, you're interested in this sort of thing. What if I told you that I've got another studio up there where I can catch the night spirit of antique horror and paint things that I couldn't even think of in Newbury Street? Naturally, I don't tell those cursed old maids at the club with Reed, damn him, whispering even as it is that I'm some sort of monster bound down the toboggan of reverse evolution. Yes, Thurber, I decided a long time ago that one must paint terror as well as beauty from life. So I did some exploring in places where I had reason to know terror lives. I've got a place that I don't believe three living Nordic men besides myself have ever seen. It isn't so very far from the elevated as distance goes, but it's centuries away as the soul goes. I took it because of the queer old brick well in the cellar, one of the sword I told you about. The shack's almost tumbling down so that nobody else would live there, and I'd hate to tell you how little I pay for it. The windows are boarded up, but I like that all the better, since I don't want daylight for what I do. I paint in the cellar, where the inspiration is thickest, but I have other rooms furnished on the ground floor. A Cecilia knows it, and I've hired it under the name of Peters. Now if you're game, I'll take you there tonight. I think you'd enjoy the pictures, for as I said, I've let myself go a bit there. It's no vast tour. Sometimes do it on foot, for I don't want to attract attention with a taxi in such a place. We could take the shuttle at the south station for Battery Street, and after that, the walk isn't much. Well, Elliot? There wasn't much for me to do after that harangue but to keep myself from running instead of walking for the first vacant cab we could sight. We changed to the elevated at the south station and at about 12 o'clock had climbed down the steps at Battery Street and struck along the old waterfront past Constitution Wharf. I didn't keep track of the cross streets. 
and can't tell you which it was we turned up, but I know it wasn't Greenboro Lane. When we did turn, it was to climb through the deserted length of the oldest and dirtiest alley I ever saw in my life. With crumbling looking gables, broken small paned windows and archaic chimneys that stood out half disintegrated against the moonlit sky. I don't believe there were three houses in sight that hadn't been standing in Cotton Matter's time. Certainly, I glimpsed at least two with an overhang, and once I thought I saw a peaked roof line of almost forgotten pre-Gambrel type. The antiquarians tell us there are none left in Boston. From that alley, which had a dim light, we turned to the left into an equally silent and still narrower alley with no light at all, and in a minute made what I think was an obtuse angled bound toward the right in the dark. Not long after this, Pickman produced a flashlight and revealed an antediluvian ten-panel door that looked downrightly worm-eaten. Unlocking it, he ushered me into a barren hallway with what was once splendid dark oak paneling. Simple, of course, but thrillingly suggestive of times of Andros and Phipps and the witchcraft. Then, he took me to a door through on the left, lighted an oil lamp, and told me to make myself at home. Now, Elliot, I'm what the man in the street would call fairly hard-boiled, but I confess that what I saw on the walls of that room gave me a bad turn. They were his pictures, you know, the ones he couldn't paint or even show in Newbury Street. He was right when he said he had let himself go. Here, have another drink. I need one anyhow. There's no use in my trying to tell you what they were like. Because the awful, the blasphemous horror, and the unbelievable loathsomeness and moral fetter came from simple touches quite beyond the power of words to classify. There was none of the exotic technique you see in Sydney Syme, none of the transiturian landscapes and lunar fungi that Clark Ashton Smith uses to freeze the blood. The backgrounds were mostly old churchyards, deep woods, cliffs by the sea, brick tunnels, ancient panel rooms, or simple vaults of masonry. Cop Hill's burying ground, which could not be many blocks away from this very house, was a favorite scene. The madness and monstrosity lay in the figures in the foreground, for Pickman's morbid art was preemptively one of demoniac portraiture. These figures were seldom completely human, but often approached humanity in varying degrees. Most of the bodies, well, roughly bipedal, had a forward slumping and vaguely canine cast. The texture of the majority was a kind of unpleasant rubberiness. Ugh, I can see them now. Their occupations, well, don't ask me to be too precise, they were usually feeding. I won't say on what. They were sometimes shown in groups, in cemeteries, or underground passages, and often appeared to be in battle over their prey. Or, rather, their treasure trove. And what damnable expressiveness Pickman sometimes gave the slightest faces of this charnel booty. Occasionally, things were shown leaping through open windows at night, or squatting on the chests of sleepers, worrying at their throats. One canvas shooed a ring of them, baying about a hanged witch on Gallows Hill, whose dead face held a close kinship to theirs. But don't get the idea that it was all this hideous business of theme and setting which struck me faint. I'm not a three-year-old kid, and I'd seen much like this before. It was the faces, Elliot. Those accursed faces that leered and salvered out of the canvas with every breath of life. By God, man, I barely believe they were alive. That nauseous wizard had walked the fires of hell in pigment, and his brush had been a nightmare-spewing wand. Give me that decanter, Elliot. There was one thing called the lesson. Heaven pity me that I ever saw it. Listen, can you fancy a squatting circle of nameless dog-like things in a churchyard teaching a small child how to feed like themselves? The price of a changeling, I suppose. No old myth about how the weird people leave their spawn and cradles in exchange for the human babes they steal. Pickman was shooing what happens to those stolen babes, how they grow up, and then I began to see a hideous relationship in the faces of the human and the non-human figures. He was, in all his graduations of morbidity between the frankly non-human and degradedly human, establishing a sardonic linkage and evolution. The dog things were developed from mortals. 
And no sooner had I wondered what he made of their own young as left with mankind in the form of changelings, than my eye caught a picture embodying that very thought. It was that of an ancient Puritan interior, a heavily beamed room with lattice windows, a settle, and clumsy 17th century furniture, with the family sitting about while the father read from the scriptures. Every face but one shewed nobility and reverence, but that one reflected the mockery of the pit. It was that of a young man in years, and no doubt belonged to a supposed son of that pious father, but in essence, it was the kin of the unclean things. It was their changeling, and in a spirit of supreme irony, Pickman had given the features a very perceptible resemblance to his own. By this time, Pickman had lighted a lamp in an adjoining room and was politely holding open the door for me, asking me if I would care to see his modern studies. I hadn't been able to give him much of my opinions. I was too speechless with fright and loathing, but I think he fully understood and felt highly complimented. And now I want to assure you again, Elliot, that I'm no molly coddle to scream at anything which shews a bit of departure from the usual. I'm middle-aged and decently sophisticated, and I guess you saw enough of me in France to know I'm not easily knocked out. Remember too that I just about recovered my wind and got unused to those frightful pictures which turned colonial New England into a kind of annex of hell. Well, in spite of all of this, the next room forced a real scream out of me, and I had to clutch at the doorway to keep from keeling over. The other chamber had shewn a pack of ghouls and witches overrunning the world of our forefathers, but this one brought the horror right into our own daily life. God, how that man could paint! It was a study called Subway Accident, in which a flock of vile things were clambering up from some unknown catacomb through a crack in the floor of the Boston Street subway and attacking a crowd of people on the platform. Another shoot a dance on Cobbs Hill among the tombs with the backgrounds of today. Then there were any number of cellar views, with monsters creeping in through holes and rifts in the masonry and grinning as they squatted behind barrels or furnaces and waited for their first victim to descend the stairs. One disgusting canvas seemed to depict a vast cross-section of Beacon Hill, with ant-like armies of the mephitic monsters squeezing themselves through burrows that honeycombed the ground. Dances in the modern cemeteries were freely pictured, and another conception somehow shocked me more than all the rest. A scene in an unknown vault, where scores of the beasts crowded about one who held a well-known Boston guidebook and was evidently reading aloud. All were pointing to a certain passage, and every face seemed so distorted with epileptic and reverberant laughter that I almost thought I heard the fiendish echoes. The title of the picture was... Holmes, Lowell, and Longfellow lie buried in Mount Auburn. As I gradually steadied myself and got readjusted to the second room of deviltry and morbidity, I began to analyze some of the points in my sickening loathing. In the first place, I said to myself, these things were repelled because of the utter inhumanity and callous cruelty they shewed in Pikmin. The fellow must be a relentless enemy of all mankind to take such glee in the torture of brain and flesh and the degradation of the moral tenement. In the second place, they terrified because of their very greatness. Their art was the art that convinced. When we saw the pictures, we saw the demons themselves and were afraid of them. And the queer part was that Pikmin got none of his power from the use of selectiveness or bizarre. Nothing was blurred, distorted, or conventionalized. Outlines were sharp and lifelike, and details were almost painfully defined. And the faces! It was not any mere artist's interpretation that we saw. It was pandemonium itself, crystal clear and stark objectivity. That was it, by heaven, the man was not a fantasy or romanticist at all. He did not even try to give us the cheering, prismatic ephemera of dreams, but coldly and sardonically reflected some stable, mechanistic, and well-established horror world which he saw fully, brilliantly, squarely, and unfalteringly. God knows what that world can have been, or where he ever glimpsed the blasphemous shapes that loped and trotted and crawled through it. But whatever the baffling source of his images, one thing was plain. Pickman was, in every sense, 
in connection and in execution, a thorough, painstaking, and almost scientific realist. My host was now leading the way down to the cellar to his actual studio, and I braced myself for some hellish effects among the unfinished canvases. As we reached the bottom of the damp stairs, he turned his flashlight to a corner of the large open space at hand, revealing the circular brick curb of what was evidently a great well on the earthen floor. We walked nearer, and I saw that it must be five feet across, with walls a good foot thick and some six inches above the ground level solid work of the 17th century, or I was much mistaken. That, Pickman said, was the kind of thing he had been talking about, an aperture of the network of tunnels that used to undermine the hill. I noticed idly that it did not seem to be bricked up, and that a heavy disk of wood formed the apparent cover. Thinking of the things that this well must have been connected with, if Pickman's wild hints had not been more rhetoric, I shivered slightly then turned to follow him up a step and through a narrow door into a room of fair size, provided with a great wooden floor and furnished as a studio, and a settling gas outfit gave the light necessary for work. The unfinished pictures on the easel, or propped up against the walls, were as ghastly as the finished ones upstairs, and shewed the painstaking methods of the artist. Scenes were blocked out with extreme care and pencil guidelines told up the minute exactitude which Pickman used in getting the right perspectives and proportions. The man was great. I say it even now, knowing as much as I do. A large camera on a table excited my notice, and Pickman told me that he used it in taking scenes for backgrounds, so that he might paint them from photographs in a studio instead of carting his outfit around the town for this or that view. He found a photograph quite as good as an actual scene or model for sustained work, and declared he employed them regularly. There was something very disturbing about the nauseous sketches and half-finished monstrosities that leered around from every side of the room, and when Pickman suddenly unveiled a huge canvas on the side away from the lights, I could not for my life keep back a loud scream. The second I had emitted that night, it echoed and echoed through the dim vaultings of that ancient and nitrous cellar and had to choke back a flood of reaction that threatened to burst out as hysterical laughter. Merciful creator, Elliot. But I don't know how much was real and how much was feverish fancy. Doesn't seem to me that Earth can hold a dream like that. It was a colossal and nameless blasphemy with glaring red eyes and it held in bony claws a thing that had been a man, gnawing at the head as a child nibbles at a stick of candy. Its position was a kind of crouch, and as one looked, one felt that at any moment it might drop its present prey and seek a juicier morsel. But damn it all, it wasn't even a fiendish subject that made it such an immoral foundation of all panic. Not that, nor the dog face with its pointed ears, bloodshot eyes, flat nose, and drooping lips. It wasn't the scaly claws, nor the mold-caked body, nor the half-hoofed feet. None of these. Though any of them might well have driven an excitable man to madness. It was the technique, Elliot. The cursed, the impious, the unnatural technique. As I am a living being, I never elsewhere saw the actual breath of life so fused into a canvas. The monster was there. It glared and gnawed and gnawed and glared, and I knew that only a suspension of nature's laws could ever let a man paint a thing like that without a model, without some glimpse of the nether world which no mortal unsold to the fiend has ever had. Pinned with thumbtack to a vacant part of the canvas was a piece of paper now badly curled up. Probably I bought a photograph from which Pickman meant to paint a background as hideous as the nightmare it was to enhance. I reached out to uncurl and look at it, when suddenly I saw Pickman start as if shot. He had been listening with peculiar intensity ever since my shock scream had waked unaccustomed echoes in a dark cellar, and now he seemed struck with a fright which, though not comparable to my own, had in it more of the physical than of the spiritual. He drew a revolver and motioned me to silence, then stepped out into the main cellar and closed the door behind him. I think I was paralyzed for an instant, imitating Pickman's listening. I fancied I heard a faint scurrying sound somewhere, and a series of squeals or bleats in a direction I couldn't determine. I fought a huge rats and shuddered, 
Then there came a subdued sort of clatter, which somehow set me all in goose flesh. A furative, groping kind of clatter, though I can't attempt to convey what I mean in words. It was like a heavy wood falling on stone or brick. Wood on brick? What did that make me think of? Came again. Louder. It was a vibration, as if the wood had fallen further than it had fallen before. After that, followed a sharp grating noise. A shouted gibberish from Pikmin, and the deafening discharge of all six chambers of a revolver, fired spectacularly as a lion tamer might fire in the air for effect. A muffled squeal or squawk, and a thud. Then more wood and a brick grating. A pause, and then the opening of the door, at which, I'll confess, I started violently. Pikmin reappeared with a smoking weapon, cursing the bloated rats that infested the ancient well. The deuce knows what they eat, Thurber. He grinned. For those archaic tunnels touch graveyard and witch den and sea coast. But whatever it is, they must have run short. For they were devilishly anxious to get out. Your yelling stirred them up, I fancy. Better be cautious in these old places. Our rodent friends are the one drawback. Though I sometimes think they're a positive asset by the way of atmosphere and color. Well, Elliot, that was the end of tonight's adventure. Pikmin had promised to shoe me the place, and heaven knows he had done it. He led me out of the tangle of alleys in another direction, it seems. For when we sighted a lamppost, we were in a half-familiar street with monotonous rows of mingled tenement blocks and old houses. Charter Street, it turned out to be. But I was too flustered to notice just where we hit it. We were too late for the elevated and walked back downtown through Hanover Street. I remember that walk. We switched from Tremont up to Beacon, and Pickman left me at the corner of Joy, where I turned off. I never spoke to him again. Why did I drop him? Don't be impatient. Wait till I ring for coffee. We've had enough of the other stuff. But I for one need something. No, it wasn't the paintings I saw in that place. Though, I'll swear, they were enough to get a monster size in nine-tenths of the homes and clubs in Boston. And I guess you won't wonder now why I have to steer clear of subways and cellars. It was... something I found in my coat the next morning. You know, the curled up paper tacked to that frightful canvas off the cellar? The thing I thought was a photograph of some scene he meant to use as a background for that monster? That last scare had come while I was reaching to uncurl it. And it seems, I'd vacantly crumpled it up into my pocket. But here's the coffee. Take it black, Elliot, if you're wise. Yes, the paper was the reason I dropped Pikmin. Richard Upton Pikmin, the greatest artist I've ever known. And the foulest being that ever leaped the bounds of life into the pits of myth and madness. Elliot, old Reed was right. He wasn't strictly human. He was born in a strange shadow, where he'd found a way to unlock the forbidden gate. It's all the same now, for he's gone. Back into the fabulous darkness he loved to haunt. Here, let's have the chandelier going. Don't ask me to explain or even conjecture about what I burned. Don't ask me either what lay behind the mole-like scrambling Pikmin was so keen to pass off as rats. There are secrets, you know, which might have come down from the old Salem times, and cotton matter tells even stranger things. You know how damned lifelike Pikmin's paintings were? How we all wondered where he got those faces? Well, that paper wasn't a photograph of any background after all. What it chewed was simply the monstrous being he was painting on that awful canvas it was the model he was using and its background was merely the wall of the cellar studio and minute detail. But by God, Elliot, it was a photograph from life. You ask me to explain why I'm afraid of a draught of cool air, why I shiver more than others upon entering a cold room and seem nauseated and repelled when the chill of evening creeps through the heat of a mild autumn day. There are those who say I respond to the cold as others do to a bad odor, 
and I'm the last to deny the impression. What I will do is to relate the most horrible circumstance I ever encountered and leave it to you to judge whether or not this forms a suitable explanation of my peculiarity. It is a mistake to fancy that horror is associated inextricably with darkness, silence and solitude. I found it in the glare of mid-afternoon, in the clangor of a metropolis and in the teeming midst of a shabby and commonplace rooming house with a prosaic landlady and two stalwart men by my side. In the spring of 1923, I had secured some dreary and unprofitable magazine work in the city of New York, and being unable to pay any substantial rent, began drifting from one cheap boarding establishment to another in search of a room which might combine the qualities of decent cleanliness and durable furnishings and very reasonable price. It soon developed that I had only a choice between different evils, but after a time I came upon a house in West 14th Street which disgusted me much less than the others I had sampled. The place was a four-story mansion of brownstone, dating apparently from the late 40s, and fitted with woodwork and marble whose stained and sullied splendor argued a descent from high levels of tasteful opulence. In the rooms, large and lofty, and decorated with impossible paper and ridiculously ornate stucco cornices, there lingered a depressing mustiness and a hint of obscure cookery. But the floors were clean, the linen tolerably regular, and the hot water not too often cold or turned off, so that I came to regard it as at least a bearable place to hibernate till one might really live again. The landlady, a slanterly, almost bearded Spanish woman named Herrero, did not annoy me with gossip or with criticisms of the late burning electric light in my third floor front hall room, and my fellow lodgers were as quiet and uncommunicative as one might desire, being mostly Spaniards, little above the coarsest and crudest grade. Only the din of streetcars in the thoroughfare below proved a serious annoyance. I had been there about three weeks when the first odd incident occurred. One evening, at about eight, I heard a spattering on the floor and became suddenly aware that I had been smelling the pungent odor of ammonia for some time. Looking about, I saw that the ceiling was wet and dripping, the soaking apparently proceeding from a corner on the side towards the street. Anxious to stop the matter at its source, I hastened to the basement to tell the landlady, and was assured by her that the trouble would quickly be set right. Dr. Munoz, she cried as she rushed upstairs ahead of me. He have spilled his chemicals. He is too sick for Dr. himself, sicker and sicker all the time but he will not have no hotel for help. He is very queer in his sickness, and all day he take the funny smelling baths and he cannot get excited or warm. All his own housework he do. His little room are full of bottles and machines, and he do not have work as doctor, but he was great once. My father in Barcelona have heard of him, and only just now he fix an arm of plumber that he got hurt by accident. He never go out, only on roof, and my boy Esteban, he bring him his food and laundry and medicines and chemicals. My God, the Salamoniac that man used for keep himself cool. Miss Herrero disappeared up the staircase to the fourth floor, and I returned to my room. The ammonia ceased to drip, and as I cleaned up what had spilled and opened the window for air, I heard the landlady's heavy footsteps above me. Dr. Munoz, I had never heard, save for certain sounds as of some gasoline-driven mechanism, since his step was soft and gentle. I wondered for a moment what the strange affliction of this man might be, and whether his obstinate refusal of outside aid were not the result of a rather baseless eccentricity. There is, I reflected tritely, an infinite deal of pathos in the state of an eminent person who has come down in the world. I might have never known Dr. Munoz had it not been for the heart attack that suddenly seized me one forenoon as I sat writing in my room. Physicians had told me of the dangers of those spells and I knew there was no time to be lost. So remembering what the landlady had said about the invalid's help of the injured workman, I dragged myself upstairs and knocked feebly at the door above mine. My knock was answered in good English by a curious voice some distance to the right, asking my name and business. And these things being stated, there came an opening of the door next to the one I had sought. A rush of cool air greeted me, and though the day was one of the hottest of late June, I shivered as I crossed the threshold into a large apartment whose rich and tasteful decoration surprised me in its nest of squalor and seediness. 
A folding couch now filled this diurnal roll of a sofa, and the mahogany furniture, sumptuous hangings, old paintings, the mellow bookshelves all bespoke a gentleman's study rather than the boarding house bedroom. I now saw that the hall across mine, the lethal room of bottles and machines which Miss Herrero had mentioned, was merely the laboratory of the doctor, and that his main living quarters lay in the spacious adjoining room whose convenient alcoves and large contiguous bathroom permitted him to hide all dressers and obtrusive utilitarian devices. Dr. Munoz, most certainly, was a man of birth, cultivation, and discrimination. The figure before me was short but extensively proportioned and clad in somewhat formal dress of perfect cut and fit. A high-bred face of masterful, though not arrogant expression was adorned by a short iron-gray full beard and an old-fashioned prince nez shielded the full dark eyes and surmounted an aquiline nose which gave a moorish touch to the physiognomy otherwise dominantly Celtiberian. Thick, well-trimmed hair that argued the punctuous calls of a barber was parted gracefully above a high forehead, and the whole picture was one of striking intelligence and superior blood and breeding. Nevertheless, as I saw Dr. Munoz in the blast of cool air, I felt a repugnance which nothing in his aspect could justify. Only his livid inclined complexion and coldness of touch could have afforded a physical basis for this feeling, and even those things should have been excusable considering the man's known invalidism. It might, too, have been the singular cold that alienated me for such chilliness was abnormal on so hot a day, and abnormal always excites aversion, distrust, and fear. But repugnance was soon forgotten in admiration, for the strange physician's extreme skill at once became manifest despite the ice coldness and shakiness of his bloodless looking hands. He clearly understood my needs at a glance, and ministered to them with a master's deftness, the while reassuring me in a finely modulated though oddly hollow and timberless voice that he was the bitterest of sworn enemies of death, and had sunk his fortune and lost all his friends in a lifetime of bizarre experiment devoted to its bafflement and extirpation. Something of the benevolent fanatic seemed to reside in him, and he rambled on almost garrulously as he sounded my chest and mixed a suitable draught of drugs fetched from the small laboratory room. Evidently, he found the society of a well-born man a rare novelty in this dingy environment and was moved to unaccustomed speech as memories of better days surged over him. His voice, if queer, was at least soothing, and I could not even perceive that he breathed as the fluent sentences rolled urbanely out. He sought to distract my mind from my own seizures by speaking of his theories and experiments, and I remember his tactfully consoling me about my weak hearts by insisting that will and consciousness are stronger than organic life itself, so that if a bodily frame be but organically healthy and carefully preserved, it may, through a scientific enhancement of these qualities, retain a kind of nervous animation despite the most serious impairments, defects, and even absences in a battery of specific organs. He might, he half jestingly said, someday teach me to live, or at least to possess some kind of conscious existence without any heart at all. For his part, he was afflicted with a complication of maladies requiring a very exact regiment which included constant cold. Any marked rise in temperature might, if prolonged, affect him fatally, and the frigidity of his habitation, some 55 or 56 degrees Fahrenheit, was maintained by an absorption system of ammonia cooling, the gasoline engine of whose pumps I had often heard in my own room below. Relieved of my seizure in a marvelously short while, I left the shivery place a disciple and devotee of the gifted recluse. After that, I paid him frequent overcoated calls, listening while he told me of secret researches and almost ghastly results, and trembling a bit when I examined the unconventional and astonishingly ancient volumes on his shelves. I was eventually, I may add, almost cured of my disease for all time by skillful ministrations. It seems that he did not scorn the incantations of the medievalists, since he believed these cryptic formulae to contain rare psychological stimuli which might conceivably have singular effects on the substance of a nervous system from which organic pulsations had fled. I was touched by his account of the aged Dr. Torres of Valencia, who had shared his earlier experiments with him through the great illness of 18 years before, whence his present disorders proceeded. No sooner had the venerable practitioner served his colleague then he himself succumbed to the grim enemy he had fought. Perhaps the strain had been too great, for Dr. Munoz made it whisperingly clear 
though not in detail, that the methods of healing had been most extraordinary, involving scenes and processes not welcomed by elderly and conservative Galens. As the weeks passed, I observed with regrets that my new friend was indeed slowly but unmistakably losing ground physically, as Miss Herrero had suggested. The livid aspect of his countenance was intensified, his voice became hollow and indistinct, his muscular motions were less perfectly coordinated, and his mind and will displayed less resilience and initiative. Of this sad change he seemed by no means unaware, and little by little his expression and conversation both took on a gruesome irony which restored in me something of the subtle repulsion I had originally felt. He developed strange caprices, acquiring a fondness for exotic spices and Egyptian incense till his room smelled like the vault of the sepulchred pharaoh in the Valley of Kings. At the same time, his demands for cold air increased, and with my aid he amplified the ammonia piping of his room and modified the pumps and feed of his refrigeration machine till he could keep the temperatures as low as 34 or 40 degrees and then finally even 28 degrees. The bathroom and the laboratory, of course, being less chilled, in order that the water might not freeze, and that the chemical process might not be impeded. The tenant adjoining him complained of the icy air from around the connecting room, so I helped him fit heavy hangings to obviate the difficulty. A kind of growing horror of outre and morbid cast seemed to possess him. He talked of death incessantly, but laughed hollowly when such things as burial or funeral arrangements were gently discussed. All in all, he became a disconcerting and even more gruesome companion, yet in my gratitude for his healing, I could not well abandon him to the strangers around him, and was careful to dust his room and attend to his knees each day, muffled in a heavy ulster which I bought especially for the purpose. I likewise did much of his shopping, and gasped in bafflement at some of the chemicals he ordered from druggists and laboratory supply houses. An increasing and unexplained atmosphere of panic seemed to rise around his apartment. The whole house, as I have said, had a musty odor, but the smells in his room was worse, and in spite of all the spices and incense and the pungent chemicals of the now incessant baths which he insisted on taking unaided, I perceived that it must be connected with his ailment, and shuddered when I reflected on what that ailment might be. Miss Herrero crossed herself when she looked at him, and gave him up unreservedly to me, not even letting her son Esteban continue to run errands for him. When I suggested her physicians, the sufferer would fly into as much of a rage as he seemed to dare to entertain. He evidently feared the physical effect of violent emotion, yet his will and driving force waxed rather than waned, and he refused to be confined to his bed. The lassitude of his earlier ill days gave place to a return of his fiery purpose so that he seemed about to hurl defiance at the death demon even as the ancient enemy seized him. The pretense of eating, always curiously like a formality with him, he virtually abandoned, and mental power alone appeared to keep him from total collapse. He acquired a habit of writing long documents of some sort, which he carefully sealed and filled with injunctions that I transmit them after his death to certain persons who he named, for the most part lettered East Indians, but including a once celebrated French physician, now generally thought dead, and about whom the most inconceivable things had been whispered. As it happened, I burned all these papers undelivered and unopened. His aspect and voice became utterly frightful and his presence almost unbearable. One September day, an unexpected glimpse of him induced an epileptic fit in a man who had come to repair his electronic desk lamp, a fit for which he prescribed effectively whilst keeping himself well out of sight. That man, oddly enough, had been through the terrors of the Great War without having incurred any fright so thorough. Then, in the middle of October, the horror of horrors came with stupefying suddenness. One night, at about 11, the pump of the refrigerating machine broke down so that within three hours the process of ammonia cooling became impossible. Dr. Munoz summoned me by thumping on the floor, and I worked desperately to repair the injury while my host cursed in tone whose lifeless, rattling hollowness surpassed description. My amateur efforts, however, provided of no use, and when I had brought in a mechanic from the neighboring all-night garage, we learned that nothing could be done till morning, when a new piston would have to be obtained. The Murbound's hermit rage and the fear swelling to grotesque proportions seemed likely to shatter what remained of his failing physique, and once a spasm caused him to clasp his hands to his eyes and rush into the bathroom. He groped his way out with a face tightly bandaged, and I never saw his eyes again. 
The frigidity of the apartment was now sensibly diminishing, and at about 5 a.m. the doctor retired to the bathroom, commanding me to keep him supplied with all the ice he could obtain at all night drugstores and cafeterias. As I would return from my sometimes discouraging trips and lay my spoils before the closed bathroom doors, I would hear a restless splashing within, and a thick voice croaking out the order for more, more. At length, a warm day broke, and the shops opened one by one. I asked Esteban to help me with the ice fetching whilst I obtained the pump piston or to order the piston while I continued with the ice, but instructed by his mother, he absolutely refused. Finally, I hired a seedy-looking loafer whom I encountered on the corner of 8th Avenue to keep the patient supplied with ice from a little shop where I introduced him, and applied myself diligently to the task of finding a pump piston and engaging workmen competent to install it. The task seemed interminable, and I raged almost as violently as the hermit when I saw the hours slipping by in a breathless, foodless round of vain telephoning and a hectic quest from place to place, hitter and titter by subway and surface car. About noon, I encountered a suitable supply house far downtown, and at approximately 1.30 p.m. arrived at my boarding house with the necessary paraphernalia and two sturdy and intelligent mechanics. I had done all I could and hoped I was in time. Black terror, however, had preceded me. The house was another turmoil, and above the chatter and awed voices I heard a man praying in a deep basso. Fiendish things were in the air, and lodgers told over beads of their rosaries as they caught the odor from beneath the doctor's closed door. The lounger I had hired, it seems, had fled screaming and mad-eyed not long after his second delivery of ice, perhaps as a result of excessive curiosity. He could not, of course, have locked the door behind him. It was now fastened, presumably, from the inside. There was no sound within save a nameless sort of slow, thick dripping. Briefly consulting with Miss Herrero and the workmen, despite a fear that gnawed my inmost soul, I advised the breaking down of the door. But the landlady found a way to turn the key from the outside with some wired device. We had previously opened the doors of all the other rooms on the hall and flung all the windows to the very top. Now, noses protected by handkerchiefs, we tremblingly invaded the cursed south room which blazed with the warm sun of early afternoon. A kind of dark, slimy trail led from the open bathroom door to the hall door, and thence to the desk where a terrible little pool had accumulated. Something was scrawled there in pencil, in an awful blind hand of a piece of paper hideously smeared as though by the very claws that traced the hurried last words. Then the trail led to the couch and ended unutterably. What was or had been on the couch, I cannot and dare not say here. But this is what I shiveringly puzzled out on a stickly smeared paper before I drew a match and burned it to a crisp. What I puzzled out in terror as the landlady and the two mechanics rushed frantically from that hellish place to babble their incoherent stories at the nearest police station. The nauseous words seemed well nigh indescribable in that yellow sunlight, with the clatter of cars and motor trucks ascending clamorously from crowded 14th Street, yet I confess that I believed them then. Whether I believe them now, I honestly do not know. There are things about which it is better not to speculate, and all that I can say is that I hate the smell of ammonia and grow faint at a draught of unusually cool air. The end ran the noisome scrawl is here no more ice the man looked and ran away warmer every minute and the tissues can't last i fancy you know what i said about the will and the nerves and the persevered body after the organ ceased to work it was a good theory but it couldn't keep up indefinitely there was a gradual deterioration I had not foreseen. Dr. Torres knew, but the shock killed him. He couldn't stand what he had to do. He had to get me in a strange, dark place when he minded my letter and nursed me back. And the organs never would work again. It had to be done my way. Artificial preservation. For you see... I died, that time, 18 years ago. I 
I have frequently wondered if the majority of mankind ever pauses to reflect upon the occasionally titanic significance of dreams and of the obscure world to which they belong. Whilst a greater number of our nocturnal visions are perhaps no more than faint and fantastic reflections of our waking experience, Freud to the contrary with his puerile symbolism, there are still a certain remainder whose immundane and ethereal character permits of no ordinary interpretation and whose vaguely exciting and disquieting effects suggest possible minute glimpses into a sphere of mental existence no less important than physical life, yet separated from that life by an all but impassable barrier. From my experience, I cannot doubt but that man, when lost to terrestrial consciousness, is indeed sojourning in another and uncorporeal life of far different nature from the life we know, and of which only the slightest and most indistinct memories linger after waking. From those blurred and fragmentary memories, we may infer much, yet prove little. We may guess that in dreams, life, matter and vitality, as the earth knows such things, are not necessarily constant, and that time and space do not exist as our waking selves comprehend them. Sometimes I believe that this less material life is our truer life, and that our vain presence on the terraqueous globe is itself the secondary or merely virtual phenomenon. It was from a youthful revere filled with speculations of this sort that I rose one afternoon in the winter of 1900 to 1901, when to the state psychopathic institution in which I served as an intern was brought the man whose case has ever since haunted me so unceasingly. His name, as given on the records, was Joe Slater, or Slater, as his appearance was that of the typical denizen of the Catskill Mountain region. One of those strange, repellent scions of a primitive colonial peasant stock whose isolation for nearly three centuries in the hilly fastness of a little traveled countryside has caused them to sink to a kind of barbaric degeneracy, rather than advance with their more fortunately placed brethren of the thickly settled districts. Among these odd folk, who correspond exactly to the decadent element of white trash in the South, law and morals are non-existent and their general mental status is probably below that of any other section of the Native American people. Joe Slater, who came to the institution in the vigilant custody of four state policemen, and who was described as a highly dangerous character, certainly presented no evidence of his perilous disposition when I first beheld him. Though well above the middle stature and of somewhat brawny frame, he was given an absurd appearance of harmless stupidity by the pale, sleepy blueness of his small watery eyes, the scantiness of his neglected and never-shaven growth of yellow beard, and the listless drooping of his heavy nether lip. His age was unknown, since among his kind neither family records nor permanent family ties exist, but from the baldness of his head in front and from the decayed condition of his teeth, the head surgeon wrote him down as a man of about forty. From the medical and court documents, we learned all that could be gathered of his case. This man, a vagabond, a hunter, and a trapper, had always been strange in the eyes of his primitive associates. He had habitually slept at night beyond ordinary time, and upon waking would often talk of unknown things in a manner so bizarre as to inspire fear even in the hearts of an unimaginative populace. Not that his form of language was at all unusual, for he never spoke save in a debased patois of his environment but the tone and tenor of his utterances were of such mysterious wildness that none might listen without apprehension. He himself was generally as terrified and baffled as his auditors, and within an hour after awakening he would forget all that he had said, or at least all that had caused him to say what he did, relapsing into a bovine, half-amiable normality like that of the other hill dwellers. As Slater grew older, it appeared, his matutinal aberrations had gradually increased in frequency and violence, till about a month before his arrival at the institution had occurred the shocking tragedy which caused his arrest by the authorities. One day near noon, after a profound sleep begun in a whiskey debauch at about five of the previous afternoon, the man had roused himself most suddenly, with uluations so horrible and unearthly that they brought several neighbors to his cabin, a filthy sty where he dwelt with a family as indescribable as himself. Rushing out into the snow, he had flung his arms aloft and commenced a series of leaps directly upwards in the air, the while shouting his determination to reach some big, big cabin with brightness in the roof and walls and floor and loud queer music far away. As two men of moderate size sought to restrain him, he had struggled with maniacal force and fury, screaming of his desire and need to find and kill a certain thing that shines and shakes and laughs. 
At length, after temporarily fleeing one of his detainers with a sudden blow, he had flung himself upon the other in a demoniac ecstasy of bloodthirstiness, shrieking fiendishly that he would jump high in the air and burn his way through anything that stopped him. Family and neighbors had now fled in panic, and when the more courageous of them returned, Slater was gone, leaving behind an unrecognizable pulp-like thing that had been a living man but an hour before. None of the mountaineers had dared to pursue him, and it is likely that they would have welcomed his death from the cold. But when several mornings later, they heard the screams from a distant ravine, they realized that he had somehow managed to survive, and that his removal in one way or another would be necessary. Then had followed an armed searching party whose purpose, whatever it may have been originally, became that of a sheriff's posse after one of the seldom popular state troopers had by accident observed, then questioned, and finally joined the seekers. On the third day, Slater was found unconscious in a hollow of a tree and taken to the nearest gaol, where alienists from Albany examined him as soon as his senses returned. To them, he told a simple story. He had, he said, gone to sleep one afternoon, about sundown after drinking much liquor. He had awakened to find himself standing bloody-handed in the snow before his cabin, the mangled corpse of his neighbor Peter Slater at his feet. Horrified, he had taken to the woods in a vague effort to escape from the scene of what must have been his crime. Beyond these things, he seemed to know nothing, nor could the expert questioning of his interrogators bring out a single additional fact. That night, Slater slept quietly, and next morning, he wakened with no singular feature save a certain alienation of expression. Dr. Barnard, who had been watching the patient, thought he noticed in the pale blue eyes a certain gleam of peculiar quality, and in the flaccid lips, an all but imperceptible tightening, as if of intelligent determination. But when questioned, Slater relapsed into the habitual vacancy of the mountaineer, and only reiterated what he had said on the preceding day. On the third morning occurred the first of the man's mental attacks. After some show of uneasiness and sleep, he burst forth into a frenzy so powerful that the combined efforts of four men were needed to bind him in a straitjacket. The alienist listened with keen attention to his words, since their curiosity had been aroused to a high pitch by the suggestive, yet mostly conflicting and incoherent stories of his family and neighbors. Slater raved for upward of 15 minutes, babbling in his backwoods dialect of great edifices of light, oceans of space, strange music, and shadowy mountains and valleys. But most of all, did he dwell upon some mysterious blazing entity that shook and laughed and mocked at him. This vast, vague personality seemed to have done him a terrible wrong, and to kill it in triumphant revenge was his paramount desire. In order to reach it, he said, he would soar through the abysses of emptiness, burning every obstacle that stood in his way. Thus ran his discourse, until with the greatest suddenness he ceased. The fire of madness died from his eyes, and in dull wonder he looked at his questioners and asked why he was bound. Dr. Barnard unbuckled the leather harness and did not restore it till night, when he succeeded in persuading Slater to don it of his own volition, for his own good. The man had now admitted that he sometimes talked queerly, though he knew not why. Within a week or two, more attacks appeared, but from them the doctors learned little. On the source of Slater's visions, they speculated at length, for since he could neither read nor write, and had apparently never heard a legend or fairy tale, his gorgeous imagery was quite inexplicable. That it could not come from any known myth or romance was made especially clear by the fact that the unfortunate lunatic expressed himself only in his own simple manner. He raved of things he did not understand and could not interpret, things which he claimed to have experienced but which he could not have learned through any normal or connected narration. The alienists soon agreed that the abnormal dreams were the foundation of the trouble, dreams whose vividness could for a time completely dominate the waking mind of this basically inferior man. With due formality, Slater was tried for murder, acquitted on the ground of insanity, and committed to the institution wherein I held so humble a post. I have said that I am a constant speculator concerning dream life, and from this you may judge of the eagerness with which I applied myself to the study of the new patient as soon as I had fully ascertained the facts of his case. He seemed to sense a certain friendliness in me, bore no doubt of the interest I could not conceal and the gentle manner in which I questioned him. Not that he ever recognized me during his attacks, when I hung breathlessly upon his chaotic but cosmic world pictures. He knew me in his quiet hours. 
when he would sit by his barred window, weaving baskets of straw and willow, and perhaps pining for the mountain freedom he could never enjoy again. His family never called to see him. Probably it had found another temporary head, after the manner of decadent mountain folk. By degrees, I commenced to feel an overwhelming wonder at the mad and fantastic conceptions of Joe Slater. The man himself was pitiably inferior in mentality and language alike, but his glowing titanic visions, though described in a barbarous and disjointed jargon, were assuredly things which only a superior or even exceptional brain could conceive. How, I often ask myself, could the stalled imagination of a Catskill degenerate conjure up sights whose very possession argued a lurking spark of genius? How could any backwoods dullard have gained so much as an idea of those glittering realms of supernatural radiance and space about which Slater ranted in his furious delirium? More and more, I inclined to the belief that in the pitiful personality who cringed before me lay the disordered nucleus of something beyond my comprehension. Something infinitely beyond the comprehension of any more experienced, less imaginative medical and scientific colleague. And yet, I could extract nothing definite from the man. The sum of all my investigation was that in a kind of semi-uncorporeal life, Slater wandered or floated through resplendent and prodigious valleys, meadows, gardens, cities, and places of light in a region unbounded and unknown to man. That there he was no peasant or degenerate, but a creature of importance and vivid life moving proudly and dominantly and checked only by a certain deadly enemy who seemed to be a being of visible yet ethereal structure and who did not appear to be of human shape since Slater never referred to it as a man or as aught save a thing. This thing had done Slater some hideous but unnamed wrong which the maniac, if maniac he were, yearned to avenge. From the manner in which Slater alluded to their dealings, I judged that he and the luminous thing had met on equal terms, that in his dream existence the man was himself a luminous thing of the same race as his enemy. This impression was sustained by his frequent references to flying through space and burning all that impeded his progress, yet these conceptions were formulated in rustic words wholly inadequate to convey them, a circumstance which drove me to the conclusion that if a true dream world indeed existed, oral language was not its medium for the transmission of thought. Could it be that I was face to face with intellectual emanations which would explain the mystery if I could but learn to discover and read them? I did not tell the older physicians these things, for middle age is skeptical, cynical and disinclined to accept new ideas. Besides, the head of the institution had but lately warned me in his paternal way that I was overworking, that my mind needed a rest. It had long been my belief that human thought consists basically of atomic or molecular motion, convertible into either waves of radiant energy like heat, light and electricity. This belief had early led me to contemplate the possibility of telepathy or mental communication by means of suitable apparatus, and I had, in my college days, prepared a set of transmitting and receiving instruments somewhat similar to the cumbrous devices employed in wireless telegraphy at that crude pre-radio period. These I had tested with a fellow student, but achieving no result had soon packed them away with other scientific odds and ends for possible future use. Now, in my intense desire to probe into the dream life of Joe Slater, I sought these instruments again, and spent several days in repairing them for action. When they were complete once more, I missed no opportunity for their trial. At each outburst of Slater's violence, I would fit the transmitter to his forehead and the receiver to my own constantly making delicate adjustments for various hypothetical wavelengths or intellectual energy. I had but little notion of how the thought impressions would, if successfully conveyed, arouse an intelligent response in my brain, but I felt certain that I could detect and interpret them. Accordingly, I continued my experiments, though informing no one of their nature. It was on the 21st of February, 1901, that the thing finally occurred. As I look back across the years, I realize how unreal it seems, and sometimes half wonder if old Dr. Fenton was not right when he charged it all to my excited imagination. I recall that he listened with great kindness and patience when I told him, but afterwards gave me a nerve powder and arranged for the half year's vacation on which I departed the next week. That fateful night, I was wildly agitated and perturbed, for despite the excellent care he had received, Joe Slater was unmistakably dying. Perhaps it was his mountain freedom that he missed, or perhaps the turmoil in his brain had grown too acute for his rather sluggish physique. But at all events, the flame of vitality flicked low in the decadent body, 
He was drowsy near the end, and as darkness fell, he dropped off into a troubled sleep. I did not strap on the straitjacket, as was customary when he slept, since I saw that he was too feeble to be dangerous, even if he awoke in mental disorder once more before passing away. But I did place upon his head and mine the two ends of my cosmic radio, hoping against hope for a first and last message from the dream world in the brief time remaining. In the cell with us was one nurse, a mediocre fellow who did not understand the purpose of the apparatus or think to inquire into my course. As the hours wore on, I saw his head droop awkwardly in sleep, but I did not disturb him. I myself, lulled by the rhythmical breathing of the healthy and the dying man, must have nodded a little later. The sound of weird lyric melody was what aroused me. Chords, vibrations, and harmonic ecstasies echoed passionately on every hand, while on my ravished sight burst the stupendous spectacle of ultimate beauty. Walls, columns, and architraves of living fire blazed effigently around the spot where I seemed to float in air, extending upwards to an indefinitely high vaulted dome of indescribable splendor, blending with this display of palatial magnificence or rather supplanting it at times in kaleidoscopic rotation, were glimpses of wide plains and graceful valleys, high mountains and inviting grottoes, covered with every lovely attribute of scenery which my delighted eye could conceive of, yet formed wholly of some glowing, ethereal, plastic entity, which in consistency partook as much of spirit as of matter. As I gazed, I perceived that my own brain held the key to these enchanting metamorphoses, for each vista which appeared to me was the one my changing mind most wished to behold. Amidst this Elysian realm, I dwelt not as a stranger, for each sight and sound was familiar to me, just as it had been for uncounted eons of eternity before, and would be for like eternities to come. Then the resplendent aura of my brother of light drew near and held colloquy with me soul to soul, with silent and perfect interchange of thoughts. The hour was one of approaching triumph, for was not my fellow being escaping at last from degrading periodic bondage, escaping forever and preparing to follow the accursed oppressor even unto the uttermost fields of ether that upon it might brought a flaming cosmic vengeance which would shake the spheres. We floated thus for a little while when I perceived a slight blurring and fading of the objects around us, as though some force was recalling me to Earth, where I least wished to go. The form near me seemed to feel a change also, for it gradually brought its discourse towards a conclusion, and itself prepared to quit the scene, fading from my sight at a rate somewhat less rapid than that of the other objects. A few more thoughts were exchanged, and I knew that the Luminous One and I were being recalled to bondage, though for my brother of light it would be the last time. The sorry planet shall being, well nigh spent, in less than an hour my fellow would be free to pursue the oppressor along the Milky Way and past the hitter's stars to the very confines of infinity. A well-defined shock separates my final impression of the fading scene of light from my sudden and somewhat shamefaced awakening and straightening up in my chair as I saw the dying figure on the couch move hesitantly. Joe Slater was indeed awakening, though probably for the last time. As I looked more closely, I saw that in the shallow cheeks shone spots of color which had never before been present. The lips, too, seemed unusual, being tightly compressed as if by the force of a stronger character than had been Slater's. The whole face finally began to grow tense, and the head turned restlessly with closed eyes. I did not arouse a sleeping nurse, but readjusted the slightly disarranged headbands on my telepathic radio, intent to catch any parting message the dreamer might have to deliver. All at once, the head turned sharply in my direction, and eyes fell open, causing me to stare in blank amazement at what I beheld. The man who had been Joe Slater, the Catskill decadent, was now gazing at me with a pair of luminous, expanded eyes whose blue seemed subtly to have deepened. Neither mania nor degeneracy was visible in that gaze, and I felt beyond a doubt that I was viewing a face behind which lay an active mind of high order. At this juncture, my brain became aware of a steady external influence operating upon it. I closed my eyes to concentrate my thoughts more profoundly, and was rewarded by the positive knowledge that my long-sought mental message had come at last. Each transmitted idea formed rapidly in my mind, and though no actual language was employed, my habitual association of connection and expression was so great that I seemed to be receiving the message in ordinary English. Joe Slater is dead. 
came the soul petrifying voice of agency from beyond the wall of sleep. My opened eyes sought the couch of pain and curious horror, but the blue eyes were still calmly gazing, and the countenance was still intelligently animated. He is better dead, for he was unfit to bear the active intellect of cosmic entity. His gross body could not undergo the needed adjustments between ethereal life and planet life. He was too much of an animal, too little a man. Yet it is through his deficiency that you have come to discover me. For the cosmic and planet souls readily should never meet. He has been my torment in thy urinal prison for forty-two of your terrestrial years. I am an entity like that which you yourself become in the freedom of dreamless sleep. I am your brother of light and have floated with you in the effulgent valleys. It has not permitted me to tell your awakening earth self of your real self, but we are all roamers of vast spaces and travelers in many ages. Next year I may be dwelling in the dark Egypt which you call ancient, or in the cruel empire of Chan Shan, which is to come three thousand years hence. You and I have drifted to the worlds that rear beyond the Red Arcturus, and dwelt in the bodies of the insect philosophers that crawl proudly over the fourth moon of Jupiter. How little does the Earth self know of life and its extent, how little indeed ought it to know of its own tranquility. Of the oppressor I cannot speak. You on Earth have unwittingly felt its distant presence. You, who without knowing idly gave to its blinking beacon the name of Algol, the demon star. It is to meet and conquer the oppressor that I have vainly striven for aeons, held back by bodily encumbrances. Tonight, I go as a nemesis bearing just and blazing cataclysmic vengeance. Watch me in the sky close to the demon star. I cannot speak longer. For the body of Joe Slater grows cold and rigid, and the coarse brains are ceasing to vibrate as I wish. You have been my friend in the cosmos. You have been my only friend on this planet. The only soul to sense and seek from me within the repellent form which lies on this couch. We shall meet again. Perhaps in the shining mists of Orion's sword. Perhaps on a bleak tableau in prehistoric Asia. Perhaps in unremembered dreams tonight. Perhaps in some other form an eon hence, whence the solar system shall have been swept away. At this point, the thought weaves abruptly ceased, and the pale eyes of the dreamer, or can I say dead man, commenced to glaze officially. In a half stupor, I crossed over to the couch and felt of his wrists, but found it cold, stiff, and pulseless. The sallow cheeks paled again, and the thick lips fell open, disclosing the repulsively rotten fangs of the degenerate Joe Slater. I shivered, pulled a blanket over the hideous face, and awakened the nurse. Then I left the cell and went silently to my room. I had an insistent and an accountable craving for sleep whose dreams I should not remember. The climax? What plain tale of science can boast of such a rhetorical effect? I have merely set down certain things appealing to me as facts, allowing you to construe them as you will. As I have already admitted, my superior, old Dr. Fenton, denies the reality of everything I have related. He vows that I was broken down with nervous strain, and badly in need of the long vacation on full pay which he so generously gave me. He assures me, on his professional honor, that Joe Slater was but a low-grade paranoiac, whose fantastic notions must have come from the crude hereditary folk tales which circulate in even the most decadent of communities. All this he tells me, yet I cannot forget what I saw in the sky on the night after Slater died. Lest you think me a biased witness, Nurse Penn must add this final testimony, which may perhaps apply the climax you expect. I will quote the following account of the star Nova Per Se, verbatim from the pages of that eminent astronomical authority, Professor Garrett P. Service. 
On February 22, 1901, a marvelous new star was discovered by Dr. Anderson of Edinburgh, not very far from Algol. No star had been visible at that point before. Within 24 hours, the stranger had become so bright that it outshone Capella. In a week or two, it had visibly faded, and in the course of a few months, was hardly discernible with the naked eye. Somewhere, to what remote and fearsome region I know not, Dennis Barry has gone. I was with him the last night he lived among men, and heard his screams when the thing came to him. But all the peasants and police and county Meath could never find him, or the others, though they searched long and far. And now I shudder when I hear the frogs piping in swamps, or see the moon in lonely places. I had known Dennis Barry well in America where he had grown rich, and had congratulated him when he bought back the old castle by the bog at sleepy Kildare. It was from Kildare that his father had come, and it was there that he wished to enjoy his wealth among ancestral scenes. Men of his blood had once ruled over Kildare and built and dwelt in the castle, but those days were very remote, so that for generations the castle had been empty and decaying. After he went to Ireland, Barry wrote me often, and told me how under his care the great castle was rising tower by tower to its ancient splendor, how the ivy was climbing slowly over the restored walls as it had climbed so many centuries ago, and how the peasants blessed him for bringing back the old days with his gold from over the sea. But in time there came troubles, and the peasants ceased to bless him, and fled away instead as from a doom. And then he sent a letter and asked me to visit him for he was lonely in the castle, with no one to speak to, save the new servants and laborers he had brought in from the north. The bog was the cause of all of these troubles, as Barry told me the night I came to the castle. I had reached Kildare in the summer sunsets, as the gold of the sky lighted the green of the hills and grows to the blue from the bog, where on a far islet a strange olden ruin glistened spectrally. That sunset was very beautiful, but the peasants at Ballylow had warned me against it and said that Kildare had become accursed, so that I almost shuddered to see the high turrets of the castle gilded with fire. Barry's motor had met me at the Ballylow station, for Kildare is off the railway. The villagers had shunned the car and the driver from the north, but had whispered to me with pale faces when they saw I was going to Kildare. And that night, after our reunion, Barry told me why. The peasants had gone from Kildare because Dennis Barry was to drain the great bog. For all of his love of Ireland, America had not left him untouched, and he hated the beautiful wasted space where peat might be cut and land opened up. The legends and superstitions of Kildare did not move him, and he laughed when the peasants first refused to help, and then cursed them and went away to Ballylow with their few belongings as they saw his determination. In their place he sent for laborers from the north, and when the servants left he replaced them likewise. But it was lonely among strangers, so Barry had asked me to come. When I heard the fears which had driven the people from Kildare, I laughed as loudly as my friend had laughed, for these fears were of the vaguest, wildest, and most absurd character. They had to do with some preposterous legend of the bog, and of a grim guardian spirit that dwelt in a strange olden ruin on the far islet I had seen in the sunset. There were tales of dancing lights in the dark of the moon, and of chill winds when the night was warm, of wraiths and whites hovering over the waters, and of an imagined city of stone deep below the swampy surface. But foremost among the weird fancies, and alone in its absolute unanimity, was that of the curse awaiting him who should dare to touch or drain the vast reddish morass. There were secrets, said the peasants, which must not be uncovered. Secrets that had laid hidden since the plague came to the children of Perfalan in the fabulous years beyond history. In the Book of Invaders it is told that these sons of the Greeks were all buried at Talgath, but old men in Kildare said that one city was overlooked, saved by its patron moon goddess so that only the wooden hills buried it when the men of Nemed swept down from Scythia in their thirty ships. Such were the idle tales which had made the villagers leave Kildare, and when I heard them I did not wonder that Dennis Barry had refused to listen. He had, however, a great interest in antiquities, and proposed to explore the bog thoroughly when it was drained. 
the white ruins on the islet he had often visited. But though their age was plainly great, and their contour very little like that of most ruins in Ireland, they were too dilapidated to tell the days of their glory. Now the work of drainage was to begin, and the laborers from the north were soon to strip the forbidden bog of its green moss and red heather, and kill the tiny shell-paved streamlets and quiet blue pools fringed with rushes. After Barry told me these things, I was very drowsy, for the travels of the day had been wearying, and my host had talked late into the night. A manservant shooed me to my room, which was in a remote tower overlooking the village, and a plain at the edge of the bog, and the bog itself, so that I could see from my windows in the moonlight the silent roofs from which the peasants had fled, and which now sheltered the laborers from the north, and two, the parish church with its antique spire, and far out across the brutish bog, the remote olden ruin on the islet gleaming white and spectral. Just as I dropped to sleep, I fancied I heard faint sounds from the distance, sounds that were wild and half-musical, and stirred me with weird excitement which colored my dream. But when I waked next morning, I felt it had all been a dream, for the visions I had seen were more wonderful than any sound of wild pipes in the night. Influenced by the legends that Barry had related, my mind had in slumber hovered around a stately city in a green valley, where marble streets and statues, villas and temples, cravings and inscriptions, all spoke in certain tones, the glory that was Greece. When I told this dream to Barry, we both laughed, but I laughed louder, because he was perplexed about his laborers from the north. For the sixth time, they had all overslept waking very slowly and dazedly, and acting as if they had not rested, although they were known to have gone to bed early the night before. That morning and afternoon, I wandered alone through the sun-gilded village, and talked now and then with idle laborers, for Barry was busy with the final plans for beginning his work of drainage. Laborers were not as happy as they might have been, for most of them seemed uneasy over some dream which they had, yet which they tried in vain to remember. I told them of my dream, but they were not interested, till I spoke of the weird sounds I thought I had heard. Then they looked oddly at me, and said that they seemed to remember weird sounds too. In the evening, Barry dined with me and announced that he would begin the drainage in two days. I was glad, for although I disliked to see the moss and the heather and the little streams and lakes depart, I had grown to wish to discern the ancient secrets the deep matted peats might hide. And that night, my dreams of piping flutes and marble peristals came to a sudden and disquieting end. For upon the city and the valley, I saw a pestilence descend, and then a frightful avalanche of wooden slopes that covered the dead bodies in the streets and left unburied only the Temple of Artemis on the high peak, where the aged moon priestess, Cletus, lay cold and silent with a crown of ivory on her silver head. I have said that I awakened suddenly and in alarm, for some time I could not tell whether I was waking or sleeping, for the sound of flute still rang shrilly in my ears. When I saw on the floor the icy moonbeam and the outlines of a lattice gothic window, I decided I must be awake and in the castle of Kildare. Then I heard a clock from some remote landing below strike the hour of two, and I knew I was awake. Yet still there came a monotonous piping from afar, wild, weird airs that made me think of some dance of fawns on distant mantelists. It would not let me sleep, and in impatience I sprang up and paced the floor. Only by chance did I go to the north window and look out upon the silent village and the plain at the edge of the bog. I had no wish to gaze abroad, for I wanted to sleep, but the flutes tormented me, and I had to do or see something. How could I have suspected the thing that I was to behold? There in the moonlight that flooded the spacious plain was a spectacle which no mortal, having seen it, could ever forget. To the sound of reedy pipes that echoed over the bog, there gilded silently and eerily a mixed throng of swaying figures, reeling through such a rebel as the Sicilians might have danced to the matter in the old days under the harvest moon beside the Cyan. The wide plain, the golden moonlight, the shadowy moving forms, and above all the shrill monotonous piping produced an effect which almost paralyzed me. Yet I noticed amidst my fear that half of these tireless mechanical dancers were the laborers who I had thought asleep whilst the other half were strange airy beings of white, half indeterminate in nature, but suggesting pale wistful naiads from the haunted fountains of the bog. I do not know how long I gazed at this sight from the lonely turret window before I dropped suddenly in a dreamless swoon, out of which the high sun of morning aroused me. 
My first impulse on awakening was to communicate all my fears and observations to Dennis Barry. But as I saw the sunlight glowing through the latticed east window, I became sure that there was no reality in what I thought I had seen. I am given to strange phantasms, yet I'm never weak enough to believe in them. So on this occasion, contented myself with questioning the laborers, who slept very late and recalled nothing of the previous night save misty dreams of shrill sounds. This matter of the spectral piping harassed me greatly, and I wondered if the crickets of autumn had come before their time to vex the night and haunt the visions of men. Later in the day, I watched Barry in the library, poring over his plans for the great work which was to begin on the morrow, and for the first time felt the touch of the same kind of fear that had driven the peasants away. For some unknown reason, I dreaded the thought of disturbing the ancient bog and its sunless secrets, and pictured terrible sights lying black under the unmeasured depth of age-old peat. That these secrets should be brought to light seemed injudicious, and I began to wish for an excuse to leave the castle and the village. I went so far as to talk casually to Barry on the subject, but did not dare to continue after he gave me his resounding laugh. So I was silent when the sun set fulgently over the far hills, and Kildare blazed all red and gold in a flame that seemed a portent. Whether the events of that night were of reality or illusion, I shall never ascertain. Certainly they transcended anything we dream of in nature and the universe, yet in no normal fashion can I explain those disappearances which were known to all men after it was over. I tired early, and full of dread, and for a long time could not sleep in the uncanny silence of the tower. It was very dark, for although the sky was clear, the moon was now well in its vein, and would not rise till the small hours. I thought as I lay there of Dennis Barry, and of what would befall that bog when the day came, and found myself almost frantic with an impulse to rush out into the night, take Barry's car, and drive madly to Ballylo out of the menaced lands. But before my fears could crystallize into action, I had fallen asleep, and gazed in dreams upon the city and the valley, cold and dead and under a shroud of hideous shadow. Probably it was the shrill piping that awakened me. Yet, that piping was not what I noticed first when I opened my eyes. I was lying with my back to the east window overlooking the bog, where the waning moon would rise, and therefore expected to see light cast on the opposite wall before me. But I had not looked for such a sight as now appeared. Light indeed glowed from the panels ahead, but it was not any light that the moon gave. Terrible and piercing was the shaft of ruddy refulgence that streamed through the gothic window and the whole chamber was brilliant with a splendor intense and unearthly. My immediate actions were peculiar for such a situation, but it is only in tales that a man does the dramatic and foreseen thing. Instead of looking out across the bog towards the source of the new light, I kept my eyes from the window in panicked fear, and clumsily drew on my clothing with some dazed idea of escape. I remember seizing my revolver and hats, but before it was over, I had lost them both without firing the one or donning the other. After a time, the fascination of the red radiance overcame my fright, and I crept to the east window and looked out whilst the maddening, incessant piping whined and reverberated through the castle and all over the village. Over the bog was a deluge of flaring light, scarlet and sinister, and pouring from the strange olden ruin on the far islet. The aspect of that ruin I cannot describe. I must have been mad for it seemed to rise majestic and undecayed, splendid and columned cinctured, the flame reflecting marble of its entablature piercing the sky like the apex of a temple on a mountaintop. Flutes shrieked and drums began to beat, and as I watched in awe and terror, I thought I saw dark salient forms silhouetted grotesquely against the vision of marble and effulgence. The effect was titanic, altogether unthinkable, and I might have started indefinitely had the sound of the piping seemed to grow stronger at my left. Trembling with a terror oddly mixed with ecstasy, I crossed the circular room to the north window from which I could see the village and the plain at the edge of the bog. There, my eyes dilated again with a wild wonder, as great as if I had not just turned from a scene beyond the pale of nature. For on the ghastly red litten plain was moving a procession of beings in such a manner as none ever saw before save in nightmares. Half gliding, half floating in the air, the white-clad bog wraiths were slowly retreating toward the still waters and the island ruin in fantastic formations suggesting some ancient and solemn ceremonial dance. 
their waving translucent arms, guided by the detestable piping of those unseen flutes, beckoned in uncanny rhythm to a throng of lurching laborers who followed dog-like with blind, brainless, floundering steps as if dragged by a clumsy but resistless demon will. As the Naiads neared the bog, without altering their course, a new line of stumbling stragglers zigzagged drunkenly out of the castle from some door far below my window, groped sightlessly across the courtyard and through their intervening bits of village, and joined the floundering column of laborers on the plain. Despite their distance below me, I at once knew that they were the servants brought from the north, for I recognized the ugly and unwieldy form of the cook, whose very absurdness had now become utterly tragic. The flutes piped horribly, and again, I heard the beating of the drums from the direction of the island ruin. Then silently and gracefully, the Naiads reached the water and melted one by one into the ancient bog, while the line of followers, never checking their speed, splashed awkwardly after them and vanished amidst the tiny vortex of unwholesome bubbles which I could barely see in the scarlet light. And as the last pathetic straggler, the fat cook, sank heavily out of sight in that sullen pool, the flutes and drums grew silent, and the blinding red lays from the ruins snapped instantaneously out, leaving the village of doom lone and desolate in the van beams of a new risen moon. My condition was now one of indescribable chaos. Not knowing whether I was mad or sane, sleeping or waking, I was saved only by a merciful numbness. I believe I did ridiculous things, such as offering prayers to Artemis, Latona, Demeter, Persephone, and Pluton. All that I recalled of a classic youth came to my lips as the horrors of the situation roused my deepest superstitions. I felt that I had witnessed the death of a whole village and knew I was alone in the castle with Dennis Beery, whose boldness had brought down a doom. As I thought of him, new terrors convulsed me and I fell to the floor, not fainting, but physically helpless. Then I felt the icy blast from the east window where the moon had risen and began to hear the shrieks in the castle far below me. Soon those shrieks had attained a magnitude and quality which cannot be written of and which make me faint as I think of them. All I can say is that they came from something I had known as a friend. At some time during the shocking period, the cold wind and the screaming must have roused me, for my next impression is of racing madly through inky rooms and corridors and out across the courtyards into the hideous night. They found me at dawn, wandering mindless near Ballylow, but what unhinged me utterly was not any of the horrors I had seen or heard before. What I muttered about as I came slowly out of the shadows was a pair of fantastic incidents which occurred in my flight. Incidents of no significance which haunt me unceasingly when I am alone in certain marshy places or in the moonlight. As I fled from that accursed castle along the bog's edge, I heard a new sound, common, yet unlike any I had heard before Kildare. The stagnant waters, lately quite devoid of animal life, now teemed with a horde of slimy enormous frogs which piped shrilly and incessantly in tones strangely out of keeping with their size. They glistened bloated, and green in the moonbeams, and seemed to gaze up at the fount of light. I followed the gaze of one very fat and ugly frog, and saw the second of the things which drove my senses away. Stretching directly from the strange olden ruin, on the far islets to the waning moon, my eyes seemed to trace a beam of faint quivering radiance, having no reflection in the waters of the bog. And upward, along that pallid path, my fevered fancy pictured a thin shadow slowly writhing. A vague contorted shadow struggling as if drawn by unseen demons. Crazed as I was, I saw in that awful shadow a monstrous resemblance, a nauseous, unbelievable caricature, a blasphemous effigy of him who had once been Dennis Barry. <laughs>